Oh, there. Oh, look at that. There's a tree in the background. Someone is trying to repent for something. <laughs> uh huh. What's up? Uh, uh, how you doing, Bill Daly? Nice to okay, see you. Um, can you hear me? Okay, you guys. Yeah, you sound great. Okay, so the um, the the cat found out that you were coming, so he's washing up. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. Pretty All right. Soon, pretty soon, he's going to have um, a paw in the air. Like someone who's in the back of the room with a question. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All right. That's good. I like your tree. Is that the actual tree or is that your office you're in? No, that's an actual tree. That's yeah. an, I'm in my living room. All right. Well, happy holidays. Look at you. Mark, you ready up. to go? Mark, yeah, you ready, ready to go? go? You're all right? I am. Okay. Um, let's see. I think I actually pressed record just because I forget to sometimes. And I think it we're said, recording. It said you were recording when I logged good. in. Good. All right. Yeah. So, if everyone's ready, we will we will start a show. All right, three. It's oh, there show it goes. time. <laughs> hey, everyone, and happy holidays! Welcome to a Combat Radio Christmas edition with two of your all-time favorites. Number one is former senior VP Bill Daly, who worked on everything from Harry Potter to The Matrix to Batman. Lots of famous stories, none of which he likes us to tell anymore. But we'll get to him in a second. Also with us is. Mark Marshall, who has done everything from be the special assistant to Richard Donner, Steven Spielberg. He was on the set of Empire Strikes Back, later worked on the Harry Potter movies, and some other awesome projects. And he's here as well. Uh, and it couldn't it wouldn't be Christmas without you two guys uh, involved and at least on a Zoom. So happy holidays. How are you both? Well, Merry Christmas to you. I, uh, I wish you Merry Christmas, too. I'm, I have to turn off my email because it's it's telling me that um i'm getting messages so let me while that. he is shutting that down i have to point out okay uh, mark maybe you've experienced this with bill too he was like really resistant to do a show i said how about a holiday show he said, well, i didn't work on any christmas movies how about harry potter well i've talked about that too much well how about <laughs> some other you know how about this or that he mentioned some movies and i went back well how about we talk about those he's like I'll get you someone else to talk about that. I'm like, what happened? Where did when did Scrooge show up in the camp? What did Evan asking Scrooge me to arrive? play Scrooge for years at your holiday thing? Yeah, well, you'd be a good Scrooge. You'd be you'd be good because you're also a great actor. But yeah, no, you'd be good. Uh, so it's it is actually nice to do this because I didn't think this would actually happen. Uh, is it snowing where you are, Mark? No, it's just uh, barely uh, bare trees and brown uh, grass. Okay, soon. It's warmer than normal. It's almost like LA right now. Okay, soon, soon. So um, we're like seventy-two degrees or something like that, but it's but we're threatening to get rain. Yeah, I went outside for an early morning phone call and expected to be hit with like a wave of cold, and it wasn't. It was actually quite pleasant out. Yeah. Um, we were going to talk Lorimar movies, but maybe we should do that tomorrow, Bill, when we're together. Yeah, we can um, do that. Uh, just because I didn't do any Christmas movies at Lorimar either. No, I know. You are definitely the Grinch when it comes to try to, to to shoehorn someone in about Christmas. But I did see one. I did see a Christmas movie when uh -oh. I was at Lorimer that was called Die Hard. Yeah, yes. One of the all-time greats. <laughs> one of the all-time great. I don't know if you guys remember, but we got all the terrorist terrorists together from that for a Christmas show a few years back. And we put them all in yeah. a room together, the ones that are still living and with us. And that was hilarious because... They went into immediate character mode and started attacking each other on why one died where and how. <laughs> you know. oh and and it was so funny. And it was without it's almost like they had been arguing that about it for years. And now they finally got in a room to kind of actually have it out because Dennis, who plays the one who dresses as a security guard, who routinely right. is accused of being Huey Lewis. Huey, Huey Lewis, Lewis. <laughs> right. I remember the first time I saw it. It's like, yeah. is Huey Lewis? So, <laughs> yeah, I always have to tell people he's not Huey Lewis, but Huey Lewis, I think, claims to ride the diehard coattails a little bit. But um, they said, you only live to the end of the movie because you were sitting at a desk. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I but, should have been back to the what? sequel. <laughs> but I got to tell you, the police never breached the building. They never While did. Dennis right? was there. You know what? He was That's true. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that know? is true. I don't know if you guys have ever done a show together, but now we should uh, because you guys, he would love to hear that. He loves to hear people talk about his work in Die Hard particularly. But and he wasn't a terrorist. He was a thief. Right, exactly. But an they sold us thief. on tour. Yes, he was an exceptional <laughs> thief, but they sold us on the idea of terrorism. And Al Leong actually said he ad-libbed that scene. He said he um, 
stormed the lobby to hold off the SWAT guys and the mm-hmm. prop guys had put candy bars in there. So we just started taking them. <laughs> I just started eating them. And he's just like, I'm just going to do it. And the director loved it. And pretty, you know what? I guess those two guys can hold the lobby. Maybe they deserve more credit than the rest of these terrorists. Absolutely. Them, right? <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah. And Definitely. Bruce Willis was already in the building. I mean, yeah, John built- McClane was already up in the yeah. conference room. When yeah, he got- was. Yeah. Hey, Bill, didn't you work on, or did, weren't you on the lot when uh, Christmas Vacation was shot? No, I was with Lorimore then. Um, I'm pretty sure that, that was, Christmas Vacation was like 89, I think, was it? Yeah, uh, 88, 89. 89. Yeah. yeah, I, I was you with were... Lorimore. No, I was with Lorimore. Oh. We got invited to the Christmas festivities and things like that, but um, but no, we had our own. We had better Christmas parties at Lorimore than Warner Brothers ever did. I believe it, but also find it hard to believe because Warner Brothers were pretty famous. You should have seen when when we first made the deal to that year. It, I think it was eighty seven when they first made the deal, or maybe eighty eight, to when Warner Brothers bought us, and we had a Christmas party that year in our mill. They cleaned out the mill, they painted the floor to look like like a backyard patio, complete with a swimming pool. It was all painted there, okay, and there was. Painted on the floor was Merv Adelson looking up from the water, and he's completely surrounded by sharks. Okay, we <laughs> knew what we were getting into. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I mean, that was hilarious. That was absolutely hilarious, and it was um, the best Christmas party office like Christmas party I'd ever been to. And you know, and my wife was with Disney. I'd been to the the parties they would have at Disneyland. Yeah. Our thing at the old MGM studio in the mill was the best Christmas party ever. So was that when Steve Ross was running it or was that similar? Yeah, Steve Ross was the head of um, yeah. uh, Warner Communications. It wasn't Warner Brothers party. It was a, it was a Lorimar, you know, that guy. We, were, we were separate. We, we were still occupying mm. the, uh, what was then called Lorimar studios, but it was MGM when we moved in. Mm-hmm. And it's now now it's Sony Pictures. Well, Lorimar did some of my favorite movies, but we'll, we'll, we're going down a nasty know, rabbit victory, hole. But go, yeah, yeah, victory, of course, flawless, near flawless. John Houston's comeback picture. I got some great stories from the soccer players, the pros on that, the pro soccer players on that film. But uh, getting back I to have a Christmas I, present for you too. I didn't do you? think I didn't think to bring it here, but if we have a pause, I will go get it. And show it to you. Uh, we can pause. Well, we, we since, can always pause when it comes to giving Christmas gifts. Since, uh, um, well, hold on. You guys, I'll do like you. You know, when we're in the studio doing combat radio. Talk I just amongst walk yourselves. <laughs> well, look, the people I leave in the studio are usually more entertaining than I am. Right, Mark? So it's like I can step out and say talk amongst yourselves. And those are probably golden radio moments. I don't agree I, with that. Oh, you're way too kind. You know, it's funny that we're talking about Christmas vacation because uh, that was a good one, first of all. But um, last year, Nick Guest, who plays Chevy Chase's neighbor in that, was part of our cast for a Combat Radio Christmas Carol. Oh, really? Uh, Yeah. And um, I mentioned it for two reasons. One, he kind of blew us away with his professionalism and his skill set because he could just shift into different character gears seamlessly, as a lot of actors can do. But until you see them do it, you're not exactly fully aware of the of the caliber you're dealing with, yeah. but everyone came up to him and started saying that line from a Christmas, from Christmas Vacation, which is, "I don't know, Margo." Margo, <laughs> you know exactly, you know, and so like he was bombarded with fans saying that over and over again to him, like, "I don't know, Margo," and he would, he couldn't have been more gracious about it, you know. I mean. He was probably hoping for some long rider fans or some fans from Star Trek too, because he appears in both of them. But no, it was it was all Margo this, Margo that all night. And here is Bill Daly with Christmas I, I, gifts. It's in a box. Um what do we have here? It's in a basketball box, but it, it comes with this um mm-hmm. glass like box that you can put the thing into. Yeah, what what do we this have? This is a soccer ball. What? It's a soccer ball. Um it's all faded. And, and I apologize for it's faded. It's Pele signed it. Get out of here. To, he signed it to Jerry Lewis. Wow. Okay. I acquired this a couple of years ago from my good buddy, Scott Lewis. Um, 
because he was looking to unload it. Um, because he it it didn't mean anything to him. Um, so uh, he that must mean something to you, though. It. it has faded. I'm I'm really sorry that it's faded because they didn't preserve it over there at the Lewis house. But it says oh. to Jerry Lewis, um, all the best, Pele. And then beneath that, in this column, it has a date. It's uh, 78. 76. I think it's 76. Was that 76 or 78? It could be 78. I think it's 76. It could be 78. Um, Mike Douglas show. And that's Jerry's handwriting there, the uh, the date and all that. But he did it with oh, a regular nice. flare pen. All this was, was not with a Sharpie. It was with a regular flare. And it's the, the ball... It's a little bright in here. The ball has yellowed a little bit. Um, what are you going to do with that? Still, we, I, I was going to give it to you as a gift. No, so you don't have, why, Bill. That's a, that's you know, that's an important thing to be handing out, man. But I don't I mean, want. But what I don't want it to do is I don't want to see it on the, on the uh, auction block. No, I wouldn't auction Some it off. Undeserving combat radio fan. Yeah, screw those guys. <laughs> you know. It's you have to change your name now. Talking about you keep talking about um, victory, victory, victory. So when I the first time I saw this ball, when when Scott told me that um, he was looking for a place for it, um, he wanted to sell it on eBay, and I I went on eBay and I told him, "You're not going to get anything mm -hmm. for it because they have pristine Pele balls there for only seventy bucks." Jeez, but I'll really? tell you what, Scott, I'll give you seventy bucks for it. And nice. Exactly what to do with this. So it's in a box. The box is totally covered in. It's a basketball box for the um, display case. Um, totally covered in dust because it's been sitting in my garage, waiting for that time when I might see you in person and actually remember to do it. Well, that's very I kind was of not you. Not going to bring it to the Christmas thing last year because that would have been a perfect opportunity for you to auction it. You can I, look. I do listen to you when you talk to me. I know the reputation is I don't hear anyone, but uh, you could have said don't auction it off. But it would. I mean, that's a magnificent. I mean, most people give each other like Outback Steakhouse gift cards. That's a pretty nice gift. Are you sure you want to part with that? Because I will be happy to drive over to your house this week and get it. Yeah, no, no, it's yours. It's yours. All right. I've been sitting on. Believe me, I've been sitting on it for a couple of years. I've had this before the pandemic. Yeah, I've been nice. Sitting on it, um, you know, waiting for it to hatch, but um you know it's it's yours you know uh thank you for that that's very kind of you and it's it's it actually means even more not just that pele signed it but because it's coming from you and you're one of our all-time favorites and, and i and from talk jerry victory lewis. and from jerry lewis <laughs> and from jerry of course the maestro uh but um i just talk victory because i love the movie and uh you know there's not a lot of people around to talk about it anymore paley recently passed away the director's yeah. gone there's stallone if you can get to him but the guys who have the best stories are the guys who played with ipwich who were the pros that filled in as the allied players and the german yeah. players too although the german cast the guys that were cast and the german players were kind of pissed off because they were the bad guys yeah, yeah their parents had fought against them obviously <laughs> so they're like i remember uh <laughs> Or, uh, Warder Roth, when he was cast as the team captain for the German team, Bauman told me he went into the meeting with Pele and John Houston and said he had read the script and said, I want to play this part of this French resistance fighter that's in the script. And John Houston basically said, that's nice. You'll play Captain Bauman. <laughs> he goes, no, no, I, this French resistance fighter. And he goes, you're not hearing me. If you're in this movie, you will be Captain Bauman. And he said, walked out. And I said, so I said, what'd you do? He said, I walked out and started practicing my German accents. <laughs> I do have, I do have a DVD of uh, victory in my, um, in my middle bedroom. I have a carousel. It holds yeah. 400 discs um, oh. and it sits in there. So I can't like go. I, I did keep, the box you know those warner brothers crappy boxes you know that mm -hmm. <laughs> you know remember they had that plastic thing that folded over and they're basically oh, yeah. out of paper yeah, yeah, yeah. um yeah um i i still have that i i have those i have these um more modern sort of traveling cases like steamer trunks but they're they're made of heavy duty plastic and and you can and they have wheels on the bottom so that you can cart it you know like a suitcase through the airport mm -hmm. 
Um, so I have I have four of those filled with empty DVD and Blu-ray boxes because I have I actually have two of these carousels. One's Blu-ray and one is a DVD. And so that's where the inventory a lot of the inventory is. I have thousands of DVDs and Blu-rays because Warner Brothers, you know, I'm right, right. getting them from my friends and you know. Well. And I have over a thousand titles in my voodoo library. Yeah. I figured you would, you know, but let's okay. One, one barrage of excitement at a time. Mark, have you seen victory before we shift gears? Do you know what no. we're talking about? You haven't seen it. I, uh, I know the film, but I haven't seen it. Oh, got to see that really? one. Really? How did you miss then, it? You've, right after you Rocky. miss it staying with this guy for so long. How did you miss that? <laughs> how did you miss it? Because you I know? probably watch it. How did you Don't miss you that? Don't you have that running on a loop? I do next, actually next to some the days. Shrine, next to the Victory <laughs> Shrine in the I corner do. of your living room. <laughs> I do. What, one one final story before we move on. There's and then I want to shift gears. But um, the uh, I was talking to the guys about Victory, right? And how it's oh, it's such a brilliant, or you know, brilliant conclusion where they come back and they tie it, you know, four four or whatever the final is. And the guys in the on the Cosmos who played the soccer players in Ipwich when we did a show with him go that game was 120 to nothing stallone had never tended goal in his life <laughs> we exactly. they we had to kick it right to him for him to block it the, we shot for three or four days before the director finally put us all on probation and said the next guy who scores a goal is off the pitcher <laughs> 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 and they built a pub on the on the set to keep them all in check so the ad would know where to find them because they'd all wander off to go get drunk. They go to the local pub, those guys, right? So they built a full pub with waitresses and lunch menu, and, and they could just go there, and they'd find them all there. But it's kind of a charming... I'm surprised that story. your friend didn't raise his hand and say, I won't score if you make me the French resistance guy. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. ultimately, that part was actually cut, but he did tell me, like, because at the end, he's got the big shot against Stallone that Stallone catches. I'm sorry, I'm spoiling it for Mark Marshall. If you haven't seen a movie that's now almost 40 oh. years old, Mark, I apologize. Um, that's okay. And, and he kept saying I had to keep getting the kick. I kept putting it in the corner, score, score, reset, score, score. And finally, John Houston said, if this guy doesn't block this fucking goal... <laughs> You are off this movie. And so he kicked it right at Stallone's head. And Stallone caught it. Uh, anyway, just kind of like funny. Any, I, Mark, Wouldn't it have been funny it? if it bounced off Stallone's head oh. and went into the net? I got to give Stallone credit for doing the movie. And they make him they make his role in it possible. He plays a guy that's never played soccer. And they exactly. make that work. Exactly, yeah. You know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of those guys would work with Stallone later on Judge Dredd or Kit Carter. Or, you know, they... He obviously enjoyed having those guys around because they would show up in Stallone films after that. But one of the great all time great documentaries for you guys is covers victory to a certain extent in the New York cosmos. It's once in a lifetime because it's oh, really yeah. all about Steve Ross and you guys yeah. are huge Steve Ross fans. Yeah. Yeah. I have that. I have that Check DVD. I have that DVD. It's, it's, it's a great movie. Yeah. Is it so twice fun? In a, twice in a lifetime or once in a lifetime. Once, once in, in a lifetime. lifetime. Yeah. Once in a lifetime. Yeah. I'll check it out. The story um, of the New York Cosmos is an incredible right one. You could make a movie. I mean, uh, they did. I mean, it's a documentary, but um, it's just mm -hmm. amazing. It's an amazing story, and and um, and it's so they could and they should Steve make a movie. Ross, no, it's just amazing how Steve Ross could have some sort of a whim, and I'm sure everybody was sort of um, just humoring him, mm -hmm. thinking that okay, he's okay, he's. Um, He's being a little obsessive, you know, compulsive here. Okay, we'll humor him with this. But the whole idea of that soccer league, and look at MLS now, Yeah, you know? Well, so. the Yurtikins who owned the record label, right, Atlantic, were making yes. all the money and wanted to leave. So Steve Ross said, I'll do anything you want if you'll stay. And what's great about this, Mark, is all the firsthand players tell the stories. It's not like a third or fourth paraphrasing. And... uh the Yurtikans were like, well, what we really want is a soccer team. And he's like, no problem. No problem. Although the guys in the Cosmo said Ross tried to buy a football team and couldn't. And then landed on soccer. And so it's told two different ways. But I tend to think that the Atlantic record guys probably have their pulse on what was more the truth. Uh, nothing against 
the survivors on the New York Cosmos from the 70s. But and then they go around and they went to the World Cup, I think. Right, Bill? And then Steve Ross was enamored. He was like, look at how the world treats this the yeah. stage in which this sport is on. And he yeah. like got it right away. And he goes, this yeah. may be the next big thing. And of course, you know, they had their their moves that they made and it became what it became. And, and you know, it's funny because some of these guys are characters right out of movie. It's like, I know. And, 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 these guys. and the thing is, Steve was just so ahead of his time. Yeah. I, I miss yeah. him. I mean, he's been yeah. gone now for 30 years, but um, I miss him. He was, um, it was an amazing place when he was in charge. That's no, what Mark great. said. That's what, that's that's what Mark said, and that's before my time. But I want to ask you both a Steve Ross question momentarily, though. But sticking with the documentary for a second, Roth told me once, who's in the doc, uh, said that one day Steve Ross shows up with this guy that looks like he's a heroin addict who sat in the corner, and he was just sitting in the corner, and all the Cosmos players were celebrating a big win, and they're like, "Who brought the? What is this guy like out of Central Park? Who brought this?" Guy? It turns out it was Mick Jagger. <laughs> they were all trying to get him out of there and then when i guess they got his hair out of his face to see who it was it's mick jagger so <laughs> I I leave, it to mick ross, jagger. leave it to ross to try and throw the lead singer of the stones out of his locker room anyway I'm oh, sorry. Man. Uh, and mosb is a disease that can blind you paralyze you or kill you but the good news is doctors seem to think they're very close to a cure they also seem to think that a cure for nmosd will be a cure for cancer. So that's the two for one that I can't ignore. And if you're like me, you would donate today to the Gutsy Jackson Foundation. My name is Steve Sergic and I approve this message. Yeah, I worked it's a, with you Mick could... Jagger when I was at ABC. We How was were, he? We were producing the, um, we were doing, we were making, we weren't producing it. Shelley Duvall was producing a series called Fairy Tale Theater for Showtime. And they used our facility. Right for it and right they assigned us so i was a staff unit manager with abc so i was assigned to i was one of four people assigned to fairy tale theater and mick jagger did one called uh the nightingale and um and it also starred barbara hershey and mako you know mako from sand Pebbles. yeah loved him and milius worked with him in conan you, he was um mick jagger was the nicest most low key, most polite person I've ever encountered in my life. We had we had a production meeting. We used to have production meetings on all of our TV shows. Um, <laughs> if it started on a Monday, we would have a production meeting Monday morning, like at eight thirty or nine o'clock, and we'd go through the script, and then we'd have a meeting. Mm. you know about what are we going to do with this or that oh no no it's the other way we would have we'd have our full-on production meeting about how we're going to mount the production where we're going to be and everything and then it, then there would be a cast read through of everything and we were running late on that one so and it was in the commissary we'd do it in the commissary um because the lunch the breakfast run would be finished and you know we we could do all this stuff in an hour and then mm -hmm. you know um, and then be on our way, and then the lunch crowd would come in. Well, we were running late on this, and lunch crowds started coming in. And so I guess word must have spread through that lot on Prospect that Mick Jagger was in the commissary. <laughs> okay. So my assistant hears about it, and she comes running up to the commissary. You can just imagine her running up to the commissary, and she, she kneels down right next to me, and she's looking all over. And then she's being really sly. Where is he? Where is he? I said, who? Mick Jagger. I heard Mick Jagger was here. Now, Mick Jagger was sitting next to the person sitting opposite me at the table. Okay. He was less than four feet away. <laughs> Mick Jagger. Wow. I heard Mick Jagger was up here. And I said, you mean him? And she looked at him. <laughs> she turned as red as my sweatshirt here. He thought it was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then she sort of left. <laughs> There's there's this funny documentary that Dick Cavett was the centerpiece on where he was backstage with the Stones and he asks mid interview with Mick Jagger. He's like, and Mr. Jagger, what are these trays with all these pills walking around? I see these young ladies walking around with all these trays with pills and Mick Jagger's like, 
But those are vitamins, Dick. Uh, yes, we all like our vitamins, you know, like right. <laughs> Dick Cavett's like, can I have, uh, can I try? What is this vitamin C here? Is this, are these well, listen, you know, we did our thing in 1982, I want to say, maybe 83. Mm -hmm. And so that is 40 to 41 years ago. Right. And Mick Jagger was as straight as a yardstick. Okay. He was, um, he looked great. There was nothing that, he did not look like he's drug addled mm -hmm. at that age. And he's pretty much in the height. I mean, he's he's past the 60s right. and through the 70s and into the 80s. And he's he's come because Shelley Duvall was his friend and, and he wanted to get into more into acting, you know, instead of having to travel and do, you know, all the, the, the concerts and stuff like that. That's why he yeah. always made movies, you know? Right. And he's good in it. Uh, Jagger was good in that episode. Um, yeah. was, Joe Alves worked with him on Free Jack, loved him. And Mick Jagger hosted in a, an Oscar party and the whole crew could go. Yeah. And well, hang out. It, it sounds like him. He, I mean, he's incredibly polite and generous. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure he doesn't remember me that fondly. Why? He, he would if he remembered me at all. Come on. <laughs> you know. Well, I, you know, he's still doing it, too. That's what's great. You can get tickets right yeah. now. Yeah, that's amazing, yeah. isn't it? And it has to be. I imagine it's a bit of a strain because I know a lot of people wanted to go up and visit that set just to, you know, just to stare at Mick Jagger, mm -hmm. you know, and he's trying to work, you know, so I'm sure it was probably a strain on him, but I never witnessed um, anything. He, of course, I was working, too. I was you know, if I remember office. right. If I remember right, he played a role, and I'm going back to my childhood recalling this. Robin Williams did one of those too. A lot of great actors yeah, got in yeah. on that series. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, but he played a role you couldn't cast him in now because I think they covered him up and made him look like he was an Asian lord. Or yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. and I don't think you could cast. Well, I mean, Mick Jagger sort of gets oh, certain yeah, footnotes yeah, and exceptions, face. but uh, yeah, and the same thing with Barbara Hershey. So yeah, yeah, they're the yellow face. Yes. You know, but they did good. They played it well. And, uh, you know, I was I remember being enthralled because even my father was like, look, if you, this Mick Jagger's in this thing. Yeah. Yeah. If those were on like what would HBO or where did they those were on show Showtime. up? Showtime. They were on Showtime. I do have. I managed to get um, several years ago um, a complete collection of the DVDs because it was a big deal when they came out on VHS. You know, all the record stores were. You know, had these displays, and I, I have a couple of them in my garage with my other posters. But all right, let's let's knock a question based on this over to Mark Marshall since he was with Spielberg, Donner, and Lucasfilm. You hear Bill Daly talking about working with Mick Jagger. Now, give us your rock and roll icon surprise moment. Like, who'd you work with that blew you away? And then I'll give you mine, which will blow you both away because you're not uh, going to believe it. I didn't I didn't work with him, but. Um... I was when I was working in Amblin. I was Dick's projectionist, uh, Donner's projectionist at night at home. And uh, one night I was in the booth, and Dick called and said, "Hey, kid, can you come in for a second? I said, "Sure." So I, I go in, and Dick always invited me in to have dinner with his guests and everything, which was usually chin chin. And um, anyway, I walked up to Dick, and he said, "Hey, would you mind uh, passing uh, George's car up?" He he um he's on fumes. It was George Harrison, and uh, he had a BMW 750. And I said, "Sure." Uh, so I grabbed the keys and literally had to coast down the hill into a gas station because it was out of gas. Um, mm -hmm. But I got it filled up and took it back to him, and and uh, that was my encounter with with one of the Beatles. That was that was about it. Except except when I was doing Harry Potter. Um, we were scoring at Air Lyndhurst, and um, which was a converted church, and the owner was there, and he uh, offered to show Richard Francis Bruce and I um, around the, the the studio, and uh, so he he was taking us on a tour, and he uh, we came to the B stage, and he said, "There's a band in there rehearsing right now, but as soon as they're done, I'll come get you." So he did come and get us later, and and we walked into the the um, stage as as uh, the band was wrapping up and he introduced us and he said, Mark, Richard, this is Bono. And, you know, this is and uh, I was so stupid. I, I hadn't really listened to you, too. So I I didn't mm -hmm. know much about him. 
But the man that introduced us and who owned the Air Lenders was Sir George Martin. Um, and uh, he autographed a, a DVD box or a CD box set to me um, mm. as a thank you. And and I have to say that I didn't know who Sir George Martin was at the oh time God. either. I know. I, 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 wince. <laughs> I wince now Bill's, because Bill's offended. I, Bill's offended. I know. I know. I know. But, you know. I, Remember I'm, Larry I'm, Blake? Larry Blake, yeah. The sound supervisor? Yeah. Yeah, he's supervising sound editor. So yeah. I was in London for Troy, and we were scoring Troy at Abbey Road. And I'm in, I had just come out of, um, I was in the hallway. I had just come out of stage one, and I was about to go into stage two, and my phone rang. And I'm like th grateful that my phone rang while I was in the hallway. I, I hadn't thought to turn it off. Oh, <laughs> and it was Barbara, Barbara Russo, you know. Yeah. Um, my traveling companion through Warner Brothers for all those years. Yeah, Barb. She, um, Barbara called and, um, Bill, I've, I've got Larry Blake on the phone. Can um, And I don't remember, it was, I think it was Ocean's 12 or 11, or it was one of the Ocean's movies. Um, and Larry had a question about something and Barb thought I could help him better than she could. And and Larry was always very gregarious, you know, hey, Bill, hey, where where are you? And I said, uh, well, you're not going to believe it, but I'm at I'm right now. On, I actually came out of the hallway and I ducked into stage one at Abbey Road because it was empty. I said, I'm actually in stage one at Abbey Road Studios. And he goes, oh, get out of here. And I said, no, I swear to God. He said, you know, you're just teasing. me. I know because you know that I'm the biggest Beatle fan in the world. And I said, I didn't know that, Larry. But hold on a second. I walked over. There was a piano there, and I started hitting keys on the piano. <laughs> that was the stage. That was the the sound stage that they uh, kept as is, right? Um, it was dedicated to the Beatles, and then they oh, well, no, the it? Beatles did most of their stuff on two. Oh, okay. They okay. had that stairway that went up to the control room. Yeah, it was like yeah, you know. But but um, stage one was a bigger stage for orchestras and stuff. And ironically, stage two was what we were using for um we had a smaller orchestra and we had the uh the chorus because they always have you know these epic movies they'd have a chorus just singing notes you yeah. know um to augment what the orchestra was doing i never realized that but um that's what they were doing mm -hmm. and that that's why i was at abbey road and everybody was just so nice there and so casual i kind of walked in and nobody like challenged me <laughs> coming in or anything like that. I didn't have to park the car, you know, but I was like, I mean, I, I felt like I was like walking into Vatican or something, you know, it was I know. Ground <laughs> going into Abbey Road Studios. Absolutely. And especially know? stage two. I mean, uh, I, I did know who the Beatles were, certainly. And to, <laughs> to see that stage preserved the way it was in the 60s was pretty amazing. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's quite a place. It really is. And it was on my way. I was staying um on park lane and it was on my way to leavesden every day i was spending my mornings um on i was doing troy and harry potter three simultaneously and i was spending my mornings at shepperton with troy while they were mixing and then i was doing my afternoons at uh, delane lee in soho so uh, abc or warner brothers owns delane lee now um, but I was in Delane Lee so I could be closer to um, where I was staying. Um, so I was dividing my time in between. And then sometimes I'd have to go to Leavesden and, and it was on my way. We'd have to go right up Abbey Road, you know, Listen Grove turns into Abbey Road and we'd, we'd pass it almost every day. Going well, to my, my flat that I lived in during Potter was a block behind Abbey Road. So I had to walk by Abbey Road whenever I would, you know, take a walk or go to the tube station or whatever. So anyway, right, sorry. Right. You don't have to apologize, man. And you know, the Monty Python guys would like to thank George Harrison for believing in them because he funneled some of the cash their way to get those movies yes. rolling. Yes. That's who Life of Brian and, and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Life of Brian was the first because nobody else would. Um, it was so blasphemous. Nobody. I know people that won't watch it because they think it's blasphemous. But don't they realize that, like, 
Jesus is over here, and then they pan over there, and there's Brian, the star of the movie. Like, it's got nothing to do. Because he's in the wrong manger. He keeps getting mistaken (laughs) for Jesus throughout the whole movie. Uh, We just did a big thing where we uh, used a clip from it where, um, you know, the whole crucifixion, you know, line on the left, one cross. (laughs) Crucifixion? Exactly. And one guy's like, Um, if you would just get on the left, yeah. (laughs) Freedom for me. They said, I ain't done anything, and I go live on an island someplace. And he's like, oh, well. Very good. He's like, no, I'm just kidding. Crucifixion. You know? yeah. <laughs> but was, and then the guy that's hung in the cell upside down for a decade. You know, oh, my God. Yeah. So funny. So funny. So, but uh, I don't have any Beatles stories. I can't compete with you. I'm trying to think if I've got I any stones. Really I met all five of the Beatles in my day. Uh, and, Al that Molina. Pete Best. That includes Pete Best. Yeah, I guess it has to, right? Um, but, he, uh, did a, he did a book signing. He wrote a book about his days with the Beatles, and it was a big like coffee table picture book it's it's in the bookshelf over there on the bottom um and, so what happened with that and it was in pasadena so um so i went over there and i bought five or six of those books and i got I, each of my brothers got a copy and then i got one that was just signed pete best nothing else because i figured okay someday i'm going to sell this and it'll pay for all the other books <laughs> that i bought you know and uh, you but, never yeah, did but but uh, Paul, I met in the Steve Ross Theater in the museum. And George, I met at the Billboard Awards um, in November of 2000. No, November of uh, 1990, so 96, I think it was, or 93. It's on my, uh, I still have the badge. I had a badge. I went with a good friend of mine, uh, Matt Hurwitz, who is um, a journalist who covers um, showbiz mostly music stuff and things like that. And he called me up and said, Hey, I have, um, I have a pass to go to the billboard awards and they're giving the, the uh, life achievement award to George Harrison. And I've, they gave me two passes, one for a photographer and one for the reporter. And uh, you want to go as my photographer? And I said, sure. So I went, he brought a camera. I went and it's so funny because either one of those passes could have gotten you anywhere, but he didn't realize that. Um, well, I didn't either. So, um, so, so he said, okay, well, I'm, I'm, and you, you, like, have you guys ever been backstage at any awards like that? Because what they do is they, and the Oscars do this too. They, you, uh, you come backstage and then they have just a room for photography and you stand there and you hold your award. Mm -hmm. Nobody's supposed to ask you questions or anything. It's just, you know, except they'll say, George over here, you know, stuff like that. So Matt's in there doing that and I'm, and it's all backstage. So I'm backstage of the backstage and I'm, and I'm, there's a partition because everything was curtains. So there's a partition and I'm standing in the doorway and I'm just kind of looking in, you know, and um, George hadn't come in yet. And uh, so I'm kind of looking in there and I could feel like somebody was over my shoulder. I could just feel somebody's presence there. And I turned around and it's George Harrison, like right in my face. <laughs> and I, and I'm mean, startled. And I go, Hey, George, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, um, and I don't know if he was confused, thought he knew me, but it was like, he kind of greeted me like he knew me, you know, sort of thing. And it was really cool. But Matt, um, so that's Matt's how the pros, that's how pictures. the pros play it off, by the way. Matt's in there. Well, here's a picture of George holding his award. Nice. And that's at the Universal Amphitheater. Um, when they still had it there, that was Universal yeah. Amphitheater where we did that. Um, and that was a Ringo, great theater. Ringo, I met for the first time. I met Ringo a few times. Um, I met Ringo at ABC on stage 52. He did, um, we used to do a show there with Regis Philbin. And at the time, I believe it was Cindy Garvey. <laughs> um, AMLA was the name of the show. And um, it was just local show that came after Good Morning America. And um, so I used to check with the security guards every day that I left to go home because they would have a list of who was coming on the AM show um, in the morning because the, the, the last person leaving the AMLA offices would stop by the guard, give him a memo about who to expect in the morning to leave for the morning guard so that there's no problem getting people in. So mm-hmm. I used to ask who's coming in tomorrow. I met so many big stars that way. And they said, Ringo Starr. And I said, oh, okay. I mean, I, and I was excited. And it was a, that was a Thursday night going into Friday. Ringo, Ringo was going to be in on Friday. 
So I go back to my girlfriend's apartment and, um, and she's, she wants to have dinner and stuff. And I go, wait a minute, I got, I got to call somebody. So I called one of my assistants. So I told him uh, we were taking that next day off. We were going to take Friday off and go to the beach or something. And um, so, so I call my assistant and I say, look, I'm coming in. I know I said I wasn't coming in, but I'm coming in. I'm just coming in for an hour. Don't expect me to do any work or anything like that. Don't tell anybody I'm going to be there. Just, I'm, I'm just going to be there for an hour. And she's like, Hey, we're supposed to be, we're taking tomorrow off. What, what the hell are you doing? And I said, no, no, I'm just going in for an hour because I'm, I'm going in for the AMLA show to, to meet Ringo Starr. And she goes, well, bullshit, you're taking me with you. <laughs> and and that the is first... why you don't tell people what you're up to. Yeah, and then, uh, well, she, but she had a great time. I, I was perfectly happy to take her in with me. Um, yeah, right. First time I case... met um, John Lennon was on uh, the, doing the Jerry Lewis Telethon in 1972 in New York. at what used to be the Americana Hotel. It's now the uh, the Sheraton. Um, they called it the Sheraton Center for a while, but now it's called the Sheraton uh, Times Square. It's at Fifty Second and Seventh Avenue. It's a little. It's a few blocks from Times Square. It's still a beautiful hotel. Um, we went there a few years ago before the pandemic, and I and we stayed there. And I took great delight in taking Patty and Ian over. This is where I met John Lennon. Right here, this spot right here, because <laughs> he was my brother and I had we took the wrong we wore the wrong passes to get into the stage. They had different colored badge. They had green on Sunday and pink on Monday, and we were wearing the pink badges. And they told us at the stage, "You got to go back and get the right badge. You're not wearing the right badge." So we go back and and I press a button for the elevator. And it's a big bank of elevators and stuff. And and I saw Yoko and I said to my brother, you know, that woman looks really familiar to me, but I can't place her because she does look very different in person. Um, and she looked like a babe. I got to tell you, she's very attractive. Um, not at all like the pictures you would see. So, um, so, so we both look and as we're looking the second time, John comes up and starts talking to us. He's wearing his green badge. <laughs> he came up. He what he was trying to do, I think, was get away from the um, the very high strung um, assistant or manager, assistant manager or the manager of the hotel, who was just one of these kinds of guys, you know. Uh, <laughs> John's trying to get away from, him. <laughs> and he comes over and starts talking to us, and then and we did start talking. We got into the elevator together. We talked about you know what time you're going to be on tomorrow, and, you know and and all this stuff and and then uh my other brother uh came up came up to new york with us but he wasn't with us and we told him we met john lennon and he didn't believe us you know so but we made sure that he was with us the next day when john was coming on the show so that you know they could see john play and um oh my god it was pandemonium in there when when john no doubt. came on that stage it was pandemonium absolutely i don't doubt that for a second Hello, my name is Simon Williamson. Help us find a cure for NMOSD, neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, and with it, cancer. Please go to the Guthy Jackson Foundation and donate if you can. So I was backstage with Al D. Molina and he told a story about Paul McCartney once, like he was taking a break from touring and he rents this place in the Hamptons. And the guy he rents the house from says, listen, I got to warn you, my neighbor's kind of like this pop guy, and he's a little obnoxious sometimes with the music and stuff. But other than that, you should have a great time. He's like, whatever, I'm, I'll deal with it. He's hanging out like one morning after he's like trying to sleep, there's like this music blaring from across the way, and it goes on and on and on. And finally he goes up to the fence, you know, like uh, home improvement style. <laughs> And he's like ready to like he storms the fence like to tell this guy, you know, will you please can it? And he starts shouting and then he stops like mid sentence. And Paul McCartney turns around with his band. And he's like, we're doing a video here. Do you mind just uh, maybe can you curse us out a little later? <laughs> he's like, can you can you swear at us after we're done? 
<laughs> and uh, and uh, so of course he felt terrible, and they ended up having dinner and patching it up or something. He was like, "Can you curse at us after we're done?" Yeah. You know, like, "Excuse me, would you mind just cursing us out after we're finished?" Anyway, well, Paul used to have a place near me in Pasadena. Um, yeah, probably somebody, he doesn't anymore. Guys, I thought he... Greg, Greg, who was one of our um, drivers for, mm -hmm. for post production at Warner Brothers, told me, "Hey, I heard Paul McCartney bought." um a place in pasadena and um and i said really where and he said i don't know it's supposed to be this like really really nice part of pasadena and um i actually live in the best part of Pasadena. you're like i live in san marino where's no no, no 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 well san marino is a different town but i live in san rafael heights in pasadena which is the nicest part of pasadena mm. so so it's like what well, i, I I don't see how it's possible because I walk these streets every morning. I do a four mile walk. And, and if somebody's house was for sale, there's some big mansion. Cause that's what he said. He bought a mansion. If some big mansion was for sale, I know where it is. And I would know that it was up for sale. But you but also know that's not how they do it on that level. No, they don't. They, they don't put up for sale signs no. in these houses. So, um, so then my wife and I are walking and here comes this black, Corvette coming out of a driveway at uh at the 900 block of San Rafael Avenue and it's Paul McCartney you know and in this really low Corvette you know and there's speed bumps on that road I don't know how he manages to make the car go and there was another time that we were walking the street and um we were get, you know getting our steps in we could hear music coming from there and it wasn't it was Paul McCartney music but it wasn't a recording it just it had the sound of ru something rougher than a recording you know mm -hmm. and it and it was far away because he's that's removed from the street my my house is um about 130 feet off the street he's further his house you can see you can actually see his house in the movies because it gets that he no longer lives there um the fedex guy told me um <laughs> yeah, because people like Bill Daly walk back no, to no, one of those, I you know, asked the, yeah, I the, 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 the delivery guys know everything. And it's like, I haven't I haven't heard McCartney or anything over there for a long time. And they go, oh, yeah, he moved out of there about 13 or 14 months ago. OK, OK, that explains it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, if you see the movie Bowfinger. The, the movie star that that yeah. Eddie Murphy plays, that's his house that that's that's the property it's also the property they used in batman and robin you know the george clooney one for wayne manor that was that was the house where and it's been used in many many movies um many movies all right um, let me right on san rafael avenue um let me just take a minute and circle back to steve ross oh yeah um what made this guy so endearing to the two of you Mark, you want to start? Because well, Bill Daly's going to, he's going to take 45 minutes to answer. So do you want to get your answer out of the way first? Well, yes. Um, well, listen, I, I knew Steve Ross through the lens of Steven Spielberg. I mean, and Steven considered Steve Ross a father figure. Um, and I can see that. I mean, he was, he was gregarious. He was generous. He was mm. paternal. Um, he took care of his people. And, uh, um, you know, as Bill said, it was the, the best days at Warner Brothers or when, was when Steve Ross was alive um, because there was just an energy on the lot. There was nothing that was impossible um, because Steve Ross made everything possible. He was that's why we had the best talent, um, the best directors, producers, writers, uh, actors, actresses, everyone, um, because. Steve Ross valued talent. And um, uh, like I said, he just, he took care of Steven so well that, that, uh, and, and he inspired loyalty. And I think that's a rare quality. Bill. Well, St everything that Mark said, um, but Steve was, um, Steve was one of those people who could walk into a room and all the air would move, mm -hmm. you know? It's it, it's I used to describe um, 
Sean Connery as being somebody who could walk into a room and fill up all the empty space that was in that room. And the only other person I'd seen do that was John Wayne before I, um, before then. But Steve Ross also had this tremendous sense of fun about him. When you were in his presence, it was, I mean, it was all of the above. The guy was just emanated um, fun about him. Wouldn't you say? Oh, I mean, yeah. He, I mean, he was just, and it, and it wasn't fake. I mean, the guy was pretty genuine. He was just, I think he loved life. He was enjoying life. It's its so sad that he, um, that he would pass away from something so preventable as prostate yeah. cancer, you know? And I never saw him, I never saw him frown. He was, he always had a smile on his face. Yeah. Um, he and he genuinely loved people at Warner Brothers. He and he um, and he didn't look for, and he didn't look for problems, you know. Right. I mean, he he looked for possibilities. Absolutely. You look beyond the problems and 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 you look at the possibilities, and then you find a bridge to that. And that was that was Steve Ross. I wish I were like him. Well, you are. I would say you're like that. Yeah. You yeah. definitely take up all the space in the room, and <laughs> you're a man who likes to bridge to the possibilities. I mean, for sure, I would. I would seriously say that about you. Yeah. But well, um, you know, the thing is that, that what Steve Ross did was he when he merged um, Warner Communications and Time Inc. and created Time mm -hmm. Warner. I mean, and, and if you go to the Steve Ross Plaza where your office was, you know, your, yes. your outdoor office. Um, I also had the nicest office at Warner Brothers. Just he to was, um, <laughs> but he's listed there as the founder of Time Warner. Yeah. I mean, he was the uh, chief executive officer, I guess, of uh, yeah. Warner Communications or chairman and whatever, but but founder, founder of Time Warner. And, um, and I think what time did for him was because Warner Brothers also had a publishing empire. They had Warner Publishing, part of Warner Communications and mm -hmm. and Warner Music Group, you know, which still uses that logo. They still use the Warner Communications logo, the circle logo. Um, but it brought the, the merger with time brought HBO into the fold and it brought um, it brought that legendary magazine. I mean, people are not reading magazines. I still subscribe to time. I would show it to you right now. I swear to God, I mailed my newest Time magazine to my niece. I didn't even open it up and look at it. I immediately, I put it in an envelope and labeled it for my niece. And I just went to the post office this morning to send it to her because Taylor Swift is the person of the year. And wow. my, my, my brother's daughter and her daughters are Swifties. <laughs> so, uh, so I sent, but, but I still subscribe to Time magazine. Um, you know, wasn't that, was, that uh, all Henry, right? So, that was Henry Luce. You know, that was the. It doesn't become in journalism. It doesn't become more legendary than that. You know, and um, so he was able to combine this um, this kind of staid old publishing firm with this dynamic, up and coming communications company. You know, Time Warner, and then they get HBO in in the process. Well, also it started with parking lots. Well, that's that was Kinney Kinney Corporation. It started with limos. Mm -hmm. It started with limousines. He he was um, his first wife. Um, her father was a um, was a funeral, funeral director, and mm -hmm. Steve pointed out to him that you have this whole fleet of limousines and they sit idle. You use them for funerals. You rent them to the people who are um, doing their you know the final rites on people, and and then they sit idle. You sh you should take these at night out at night. You know, so he started this limo company. And then when he's while he's doing the limo stuff, he realizes that parking in Manhattan, especially, is at a premium. So how to solve this problem for him? So he started. So he bought the Kinney Corporation, which was um, parking lots and stuff. And then that that and it was the Kinney corporate Kinney Kinney Corporation. And from that, he spun off Kinney National amusements and then warner brothers became a part of that so if you see warner brothers logos from 1969 70 around that era um you'll see it's a stylized sort of a um throwback to the 30s kind of not the warner brothers logo of the 30s but it's like an art deco sort of shield with wb in it and then it has a kinney national leisure company or something like that 
And I don't know if somebody pointed out to him or if he realized that Warner was actually the big name, that the corporation really should be Warner and not Kinney. So he created Warner Communications out of all of that. Mm -hmm. And um, the rest is history. So Would you, if you were going, if you were visiting the White House or going to some big party or something like that, wouldn't you rather be introduced as the chairman of of Warner Communications than Kenny <laughs> National Parking? <laughs> I was dealing with Steve Ross questions because that certainly seemed like the closest thing to a golden age in Hollywood that we oh, had was... since the 30s or 40s, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, and it was down to uh, a person. I mean, they all felt the same way. Um, I remember there was a, a board meeting in New York that Stephen had to go to, um, a shareholders meeting, and, and Clint Eastwood went. I mean, it was the it was the, the biggest of the biggest, and uh, they all spoke for Steve Ross. And I mean, it was it was amazing. He could uh, he inspired that kind of loyalty. I remember that one on, um, on the lot in stage eighteen, but it was twelve and eighteen together. Um, they had combined the two stages sometime before we did the movie Dave. And um, so both of the stages, it was like one huge stage. And I remember them doing a big meet. I went to that meeting. I remember they all came and did that. And um, they were talking about the stage. I don't, I don't think it was Steve. I think it was somebody else on the board was actually talking about the actual stage and um, how it, um it was rick's cafe mm. from casablanca was on that stage on one of them 18 or or 12 or perhaps both you know uh but i remember that i i only ever uh met steve twice one was at a board meeting on the lot and one was just um he was walking with um bob and terry i think um walking on the lot they were it was like oh my god I, I used to have that reaction every time I saw Bob and Terry too. Oh my God, there's Bob and Terry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fun stuff, man. I, I, I there's a great book on him called Master of the Game that Warner Roth gave me because yeah. uh, the Cosmos is mentioned in it, and and in it he tells the story about how they acquired or paid Steven Spielberg twenty million dollars for the Atari branch to do the ET game that bombed. By the way, yeah, oh yeah, and all his all his executives are like, "What are you doing? Paying him? This thing isn't even worth a million dollars, and you're paying this guy twenty million dollars to do this game." And like Steve Ross had to like check them and says, "You don't understand. I'm paying a million dollars for a game, and I'm paying another nineteen for the relationship." You know, yeah. he like that's how he phrased it to them, and then they all kind of re, you know, sort of reimagined what he was trying to do. Like it's not even about a game; the game is the trigger that gets this thing going. You know, and of course, those games ended up in a ditch. More on that later, but, you know, <laughs> but I mean, that's you know, the brilliant for Steve Ross. Yeah, and I think that game is a collector's item if you can get it now. So it comes back around to being worth something, Nintendo as everything does. Is a collector's yeah. item now. Nintendo. I have a Nintendo sixty four in the other room. Yeah, you know, I had to go buy an adapter so you could hook it up. You'd hook it up to this adapter, and then it plugs into the HDMI of you know of the HD okay. TVs now. Hold on, I know where you're going. And before we get into the construction and design of Nintendo boxes, did either one of you guys work on a Christmas story? That was no. MGM. No, okay, for some reason MGM I thought one that. of you. Could... That was yeah, Bob I remember. Clark. Yeah, of course. Was a nice fame. guy. I wish I worked Clark... on. I wish I'd worked on Porky's. Do you really? <laughs> Oh, yeah. I'd love to be on that set. <laughs> you know, that's the reason they were able to do a Christmas story. He told me later that that it was it was Porky's that got that deal done because no one wanted to do Christmas story. Like that was the the yeah. wild card and it was the Porky's leverage. But, Did he ever but tell Warner you that? Brothers acquired it when mm -hmm. Turner when the Turner merger and the Turner merger happened um, just before the um, AOL. So Turner would have been around 90 eight or 99 i think i'm not sure and then aol would have been um 2099 into 2000 or so it was, ted turner was the one who chased bob and terry away that okay so that's my next question don't move because the only okay. time i interacted with ted turner is when he was sleeping in one of those rooms in building one admin mm -hmm. i found him on a couch outside of 
not Papazian's, one of the Gary Cradle's up. Anyway, um, but Bob Clark told, you know what Bob Clark told me about a Christmas story? I, I don't know if I ever told you guys or if you even care, but it is a Christmas show. So I'm going to, I'm going to fuse this one into the conversation. Yeah. He, the original father that they almost got for it was interested, who was interested in doing it was Jack Nicholson. Really? Yeah. Oh, man. Thank God it, that didn't work out. That would have you know, changed you the dynamic in a big way. Darren McGavin was just so good. I, I know he old. was good. He he was too old for her, and sadly, I I can't remember her name. She she just died last year. Melinda, Melinda Dillon. Dillon. Melinda, Melinda Dillon, Dillon. Right. A Spielberg. Yeah, so Fred Mertz and Ethel Mertz. I mean, that, he was too old for her too. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because like people say that, but I don't ever remember thinking that watching that movie. Oh, I never did either, but but because we just assumed that uh, Vivian Vance was almost as old as um, the guy that played Fred. Yeah, and those two did not like William each other. No, yeah, they didn't. Probably, yeah, they did not like each other. Yeah, and but isn't he great though in uh, Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street as like oh, the yeah. advisor to the judge? Absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, he was a great character actor in so many things. That's probably his hallmark moment. I mean, I know people would love to go back to I Love Lucy, but where he's back in the chambers and the judge is like trying to rule this guy a nut. And he's like, do you want the Christmas card union coming down on you and the toy makers? And he's going on and on. And he's like spelling doom for the the only vote you can count on is you and the prosecuting attorney out there. <laughs> and then the judge goes. The district attorney's a Republican. <laughs> anyway. I think Frank Capra had him in one or two movies as well. Probably. He seems like a good fit, it, actually. It, Frank was really good at getting all the um, really good character actors. Yeah, yeah. But uh, what I was going to say is, all right, so Darren McGavin, by the way, Kolchak. We've been watching a yeah, lot of Kolchak yeah. around here, which I don't... I cannot, I cannot believe that show went one season. Really? How does that happen? Yeah, it how only did, went one it season. It must have been in reruns for a hundred years. Then, how, how do you rerun one season? I don't know, but they found he a way. Have. But he's so good. He My is, whole family's been watching he's that. You know? He did a detective movie that was a TV movie um, on NBC by um, Huggins and Cannell, I think Roy Huggins, who had been a Warner Brothers TV exec and created Maverick. But um, mm -hmm. they did a pilot, and I can't remember the title, but it was very much a precursor to the Rockford Files with Darren McGavin playing this um, detective who only does Perfect. closed cases. Perfect. And, and uh, as a TV, and I really liked it a lot. And then it, you know, you're, and it, Rockford Files started in 74. So um, the Darren McGavin thing must have been way before that. Certainly before so, Kolchak. Two things about Kolchak that come to mind immediately, and I'll get them out of the way quick. The NFL would have never approved it today because there's two storylines that involve hookers and the Rams. That, and I was like watching that going, I get the Rams Godzilla gang, which I guess is code for their defensive lineman. But just kind of funny because I thought, oh God, the NFL man back in the days under uh, Pete w Roselle didn't really care too much wherever they got where they got their marketing. But there's also that moment where he's supposed to show up at a journalist convention, and Eric Estrada is the manager of the hotel. <laughs> God. And he's wearing a pink suit, but only Eric Estrada can make that suit work. Jeez. And then they go to Kolchak. They go, I, you know, I was Kolchak's narrating his arrival to the hotel. You know how he narrates the episodes. He goes, I promised I'd show up in a breast suit and with a haircut, but I lie a lot. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So, yeah, Darren McGavin was the dad, and he was fantastic, although I can see it working with Nicholson, too. But that's my Christmas story fun fact of the Christmas show today. Now we'll get past that. I'm sorry you guys don't have any Bob Clark stories. You know, Bob Clark appears in the movie, too. I don't know if you knew that. Where? He's the neighbor, Swede, when they're admiring the light lamp, yeah. the leg lamp. And uh, they're all out there, and they're collecting on the street. And, of course, the mom's horrified. And and Bob Clark's the guy that comes up and he's like, damn, Sal, you, you Sam, hell, you say you won that? That's a major award. You know, that's him. That pops in. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> He's speaking so. of that lead lamp uh, in Chickasha, Oklahoma, which is just southwest of Oklahoma City. They put up or they erected a, a gigantic replica of the leg lamp, and it has drawn visitors from all over the world. Chickasha, right. Oklahoma is on the map because of. <laughs> I'll send you a picture. 
Well, they were selling those leg lamps at the Warner Brothers store. Remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah I did. Yeah. <laughs> I'm right so outside sorry my office. Going. Right outside my office, by the way. <laughs> uh, that office, by the way, was good luck. I think because it was a monument to Steve Ross. So people yes. want to knock me. That were although I do remember John Milius coming over and shaming me publicly for reading a book about him there that he didn't like. But other than that, that raw that office so was a very very shamed. lucky spot. I should have been shamed. I I, I I I can't. And he and of course, look, if you're going to let anyone shame you, John Milius is the guy to do remember, it because he can. Somebody help. told me a story um clint eastwood because they wouldn't allow carts across that mm -hmm. they wouldn't allow people to drive carts and clint eastwood didn't want to go all the way around so he wanted to go through it so he picked up one of the posts and and whoever was with him said you can't do that this, this is steve ross plaza you can't drive your cart through here and clint said i knew steve ross very well and he was a good friend i don't think he'll mind <laughs> and he just he lifted up the post <laughs> drove put it back drove across did it yeah. <laughs> He has a good point, on. right? Eastwood has a good point. I think he, <laughs> yeah. but the, but my question is like, by the time you lift this post and replace it and do that on the other side, why don't you just zip around? Well, it's not like because you encounter traffic when you zip around. It's Clint Eastwood, so yeah. the traffic will stop, people will stop working, you become a disruption. Now, the the Steve Ross Theater was a really hard place to try to get to to do to screen your movies and stuff because it was also a memorial to Steve. And they yes. didn't want idle people in there, um, people less than a certain caliber to be in there. Do you remember, do you remember, Mark, uh, this being the, oh my God, around 96 or 97 or so. It had, no, it had to be 97. The, um, we needed, we wanted the Steve Ross for something. And um, you had to call marissa in bob daly's office to get it if you wanted to get mm -hmm. steve ross yeah so the intimidation factor of having to call not only bob daly's office but to talk to marissa was that was a factor in um keeping people out of the steve ross theater so mark solomon asked me bill <laughs> your name is daly why don't oh, you call <laughs> okay so I did, I did. And Marissa wasn't there, but the person I spoke to was filling in Lisa Janae and ah. Lisa Janae and I became thick as thieves. And when that conversation concluded, it was Bill, you can use this theater anytime you want. Wow. You know, and right after that, Bill Daly had Kevin James call the Staples Center for boxing tickets. <laughs> <laughs> all right more on that in the archive oh so okay God. so do you guys remember all right my office by the way was taken over by eastwood for the movie blood work remember when he turned all those alleys outside the building for that yes. pursuit scene with jeff daniels i go to report to john milius's office in building 81 eastwood had the first floor also in there was like nolan wolfgang peterson right and go in there and john milius is telling some story about a rogue german tank detachment that he wants to write a script of. And in the meantime, he lights up a cigar and non-smoking lot. And probably four or five minutes after that, the security guard comes up to Milius's office. The doors open and he just leans inside. Like he doesn't even announce his presence. He just leans like, I'm here again. And Milius is like, what? Who's <laughs> complaining? And who's here? It's like nine at night. And he goes, well, they're downstairs. They're doing blood work. Yeah. You know, so he's kind of mm -hmm. like, could you please? And he's like, Who's doing blood work? And I'm like, they're shooting it right over there by the coffee shop. And he goes, Milius does one of these. Let's get over there. Yeah. And so <laughs> we go down there and they're shooting. And I think Kakai Ampa was even the location manager doing that. A mutual friend who worked with you, Mark, yeah. on Color Purple. Yeah. Absolutely. And Milius is there, and and or Eastwood is there, and Milius goes up. You know, they have the history of Dirty Harry, the Dirty Harry movies together that Milius script doctored Dirty Harry and then Magnum Force. So he, we, I get the introduction, right, for the first time. And I'd seen Eastwood around, and he was always very classy, always very nice. Um, there's this story that he bashed a windshield with a golf club, but I can't seem to pin whether that's real. You know what I'm I talking heard that story. Somebody parked in his parking place. Yeah, but I can't. And he bashed in the windshield with a golf club. 
and and then later you know like paid for the damages and stuff like that and then so um yeah. i'd heard that story but i don't know if that was like a cautionary tale oh clint eastwood did this one time you better not i don't know i, I mean unless you see it right that's you know, my angle on it too like i've heard that from several people but meeting him and seeing him operate i'm like because he was so relaxed and low, he's key. low key he is so yeah. incredibly low key if he could be invisible if he could will himself yeah. to be invisible he could do it and get away with it you know? so soft spoken i mean tom rooker ran his office at the time and that guy i think handled a lot of the administration but so the way eastwood interrupts the uh introduction after it's done basically as he goes he gets up and goes well they're ready for me so if you'll excuse me i've got to go kill a few guys <laughs> <laughs> i've got to go kill a few guys um, yeah you know he clint brought tom rooker down from carmel with him tom apparently mm -hmm. this is what i heard um tom was his um go-to guy when he was the mayor when he was in city hall there mm -hmm. and but tom there was nothing subtle about tom tom was no like a sherman tank and um and then suddenly one day he was gone and and i heard from i it might have been pat um told me that uh, oh yeah clint got rid of him because he was destroying yeah. relationships that clint had so Rooker told me he'd been with Eastwood since Bird, rough, roughly around that time when they'd done the movie Bird. But what mm -hmm. I heard from another Eastwood associate was that Eastwood actually didn't really like the idea of firing him. So what he did was shut down the company and then like bring it back like 30 days later with Tom or something. Like he yeah. did do that. He did. Um, I have I have a story that I will tell you guys off the air because it's not for publication. Um uh, when clint did that and that makes perfect sense because it was not gone for long and then it was right. back and when so, it was back it was without tom who i yes. always got along with i thought tom yeah. was fine myself so there, there's no tom bashing i never from my interacted point i never interacted with him so i don't know i couldn't yeah. even, i wouldn't even be able to pull him out of a lineup <laughs> I wonder if I could now too, because it's been a while. And there was a lady well, the that thing worked is, in there. She was, was very Clint, nice. Clint's stuff. Clint was autonomous, and he ran. He did his thing. Um, and as far as like we were concerned, we never got in, involved in the financials or anything because Clint would do the stuff for a price. Mm -hmm. And um, and then Joel Cox was running all of his posts, so there was no need uh, for us. They would call us if they needed help with something, you know. But then towards the end, when um, uh, Rob Lorenz came in. Rob Lorenz started to involve the studio more, yeah, and stuff. Um, and it was great because they were all great people to work with. I mean, they were absolutely. It was kind of like with Costner's company; they were great people to work with. I was sorry to see them go on some level. They weren't mm -hmm. making very good movies at the time, but but um, but they were so fun to work with. Jim Wilson and and the whole yeah. group. So thanks to you know our producer here, Loda Hadley. Joe Cox has done this show and he's great because he's won multiple Oscars, as you know. And the only question I really had for him is I loved what you did cutting and editing Cleopatra Jones, but what have you done since? And he immediately started <laughs> laughing because obviously that's the one credit he never, he never hears. And then we went on and on about how Warner Brothers was actually, or one of the executives that I was aware of was trying to reboot it. But um, we ended up at a wedding and you know who was there? He sat next to me and he was going on and on about the new Warner Brothers regime interfering with Eastwood was Mike Cipriano. Do you remember really? him? Really? Yeah. yeah, he was an assistant editor. Right. For Cox. Yeah. And yeah. he's like, you know, they're all about the Matrix and stuff and they don't want to do character pictures. And he was going on and on. And, and you know, weddings are great to talk to people because when they start drinking you get it yeah. all you get it all yeah it's, true. it's yeah. like a cement truck just backed up and just flooded you with nonsense <laughs> concrete you know so he was just going on and on with giving us all the dirt and the politics and i mean i gotta tell you uh one of the people you know because she had a great reputation and still does lotus got such a good reputation people feel it's safe to talk around her like me they regard as sort of a pirate but that her they'll they'll think so she got all these great stories too and you know, she's like a trigger for, I guess, honesty in a sense. But yeah, he was a, and I think he just recently retired, but he was on all those pictures telling about how, the, I guess, when Village Roadshow, they had to go get money from Village Roadshow, the Eastwood camp, is I think what that. Well, the way Village Roadshow worked, and that was Bruce Berman. Bruce Berman was the head of that. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and he had been, he took over when Mark Canton left. It was Mark Canton and Bruce Berman and then Lorenzo and um, and Billy Gerber. And then it was Lorenzo by himself and then Jeff Robinoff in my tenure. And, mm-hmm. you know, then Greg Silverman after that and on and on and on. Um, I Phil love Bill Rocha Gerber too, by the way. With, I'm sorry? I said, I love Bill Gerber too, oh, by the way. Billy Gerber's great. Yeah. Um, but the Village Roadshow, they become financially involved. It's an Australian company, and they have a studio down there, and, and we're partnered with them. It's called uh, um, Warner Village Studios, and they have a theme park and everything down there, too. Um, but they they get they get financially involved with a lot of these projects and stuff. And I think with The Matrix, they got involved with The Matrix, because we and I think mostly because we shot The Matrix down there. And um, Bruce was probably in on some of the early development of that. I think Bruce may have been the guy that was, yeah, Bruce definitely was there when, when they did assassins, when they first Mm -hmm. brought the Wachowskis into Warner brothers and before bound was made and, but bound was new line, but new line before, I believe before they be part of the time Warner or before time Warner became a thing with Turner, you know, um, because Turner owned Castle Rock and New Line. So, um, but Village Roadshow, probably if Clint was doing something with Village Roadshow, it was because Village Roadshow probably owned the property that Clint wanted, the script or whatever. That So so you bring them on as a partner and they pay for half of it. And, you know, but they don't really interfere in a a big way. And, And the thing is, Bruce knows the score. Bruce knows how that company runs and, and what works and everything. And um, so there's no, it's unlike other companies that we've worked with, you know, I mean, Village Roadshow really have a handle on what they're doing. So um, you guys, I'm, I'm, I'm famous for working with big time people on their more forgettable or projects they'd like to forget they worked on, such as Keanu Reeves and the replacements <laughs> or Arnold Schwarzenegger and collateral damage. I work on all the shit films that they overlook in all their biographies and stuff, but you guys worked on the matrix, right? And Keanu yeah, Reeves I is did. a nice human being. He's really, really nice. Let me yeah. tell you what the problem with the replacements was when the replacements was Here we go. conceived, it was supposed to be an NFL version of major league. Mm-hmm. And then Keanu came off of the matrix and, and I believe um, wasn't the replacements before Constantine. I think so. Okay. So Keanu, so Keanu came off the matrix and, and to so much acclaim and everything. And it was so much money was made on that and, and so much exposure around the world, one of a kind thing, you know, and Keanu is in the middle of it, of all of this stuff. So when he gets on the, on the replacements he suddenly wants it to become more edgy because he's just come off the matrix Mm -hmm. okay and he's this edgy guy now um i think it would have been so much better if it was somebody who really could do comedy can you imagine the replacements if it was eddie murphy seriously yeah that's a good point that's a good point um because the movie but, does but have it its because, merits. Because it, it does. It does have its merits, but it suffers because Keanu wanted to make it edgy. Mm. And and I don't know that Howie Deutsch, I think Howie Deutsch um directed that. I don't know that um that he could control Keanu in that way. Right. You know what I mean? It's not that he needs to be controlled, but it just seemed to me as we're watching dailies and everything that Keanu just didn't get it. Keanu. This is major league. And I don't know that anybody at the studio other than me ever characterized it as, as a football version of major league. The post guys did. The post guys would say exactly that. They would say it's major league or major leaguer. That's how they referred to it in all the meetings. And even at the screenings, when we were getting into that phase of it, they were all pretty open about it. And I don't think the hard thing is when you take something that works so well as it is, and you have to make it something different because that's how you want it, you know? And yeah, yeah. The roadmap's already there. Like, just do what's there. It's easy. It's fun. You got Hackman as a co-star. Everyone will laugh and, and you can co- show another dynamic. I mean, it was cast really, really well. It was, you know? it was. And even the girl, the, the female lead in it, when she was, um, you know the head cheerleader then she was beautiful and she but she was also smart and and funny and tough 
Yeah, um, yeah. There was there was no reason for that movie to fail. No. Um, but I, I, edgy, edgy in that movie just don't mix. You know what I mean? So, you know, I want to get to the Matrix real quick, but I remember uh, Milius was trying to partner with the Wachowskis on a Conan the Barbarian sequel, and he wrote a great script called King Conan: Crown of Iron. Of which I got a copy around here somewhere because I took it out of the office with a lot of other my with a lot of other like stuff I raided, but um, uh, there were the the Warshawskis have been through some stuff, and I remember like they were calling and venting to Milius about something with the studio, and I just thought it was so funny that Milius was like their go to therapist. <laughs> I even like pointed to John. He's and because he, he's John's on there and he's like, yeah, listen. Listen, kid, you gotta you gotta just take it and stretch. Just tell them what they want to hear today. And he's like telling them all this stuff off the ledge. And I'm like looking at him going, They called you. I'm like mouthing that to him. They called you. And he's like, you know, and he hangs up and he's like, Well, he was the resident motorcycle gang guy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he was, but it was just so funny because even he was making jokes afterwards, and we were laughing. I'm like, they call you for therapeutic help. Like, what did they need armaments or something? Like, like you're the sympathetic ear with every all did their they, challenges. Did they somehow think that Joel Silver wasn't working with them? So, because oh, Joel, yeah, that... Joel protected them in so many ways. Yeah, no know? doubt, no doubt. And uh, God, not didn't that they Joel... needed protection because Jeff Robinoff had been their agent when he was with ICM. He represented now, them, right? And then Robinoff was running the studio, right? Yeah. But yeah. so, okay, so here's my question that. For the holidays, we always used to love. We've all talked about it. Joel Silver, best office on the lot. Pinball machine with his own face on it. Predator mock up. He'd walk around in his pajamas. Do you think he gave those pajamas to people for Christmas gifts? Those silk pajamas we'd see him walking the lot in. That that you know that would have been be great funny. Gift. That would have been. But Mark would know that better than I would. Yeah, Mark I didn't spend that much no, time. Uh, not not me. Um, Do you? I figured he'd be like Bill Murray and Scrooge giving VHS machines and, yeah. and uh, you know. You can see it with an assistant, too. right? Like, all right, Joel, uh, Mr. Silver, blender or pajamas? And he'd be like, <laughs> uh, Alan Horn. You know he'd be like, let me pajamas. You know <laughs> let, me, let me tell you what Jerry Weintraub would have done. Okay, now Joel oh, somehow has this bad boy reputation that he does not deserve. Because Joel no, he doesn't. really he is doesn't. a straight guy. I mean, he's, you know. Uh, but he's a bear of a man, and and it's hard to overcome, you know, his appearance in Roger Rabbit. I mean, yeah, it's hard to bounce yeah. back from that and have you think be, think people think you're cuddly. Okay, what Jerry Weintraub would have done, and Jerry's a good guy and all that stuff, but Jerry still has the first dollar he ever made, and he would have found a sponsor for the, <laughs> for the Christmas gifts. So. He would have given away those silk pajamas. Right. It would have said Budweiser on the stage. Yeah, no, it would have said Chico <laughs> Bail Bonds on the back. Or, but he'd also be so, he'd be so shameless that Weintraub would on the, have on the sleeve like his next upcoming movie. You know, like the bathrobe on the back has, you know, Ocean's Eleven on it, you know. Or... Yeah. And and not not to diminish um, Jerry Weintraub or be negative in any way, but boy, he knows how to work it. Doesn't he? <laughs> oh, my oh, God. Man. Oh, and so... Jerry was such a, and the thing is, I had experience with Jerry before Warner Brothers because he was, he and Bernie Brillstein ran Management 3, mm -hmm. and we had an overall deal with them when I was at ABC. So I did all their acts that they represented like um i don't think they represented barry manilow but we you know we did these barry manilow specials john denver specials the king family mm -hmm. harry morgan did a special juliet prouse um john denver john denver was a big one we did a bunch of things with him and and you know my biggest shining moment i think at abc was um was john denver and the muppets christmas thing. brilliant huh? and that's one to be proud of for sure you know, so and I left. I left ABC, taking a, a a page from your book. I took with me a three quarter inch cassette. It was a master copy that was sent to the National Captioning Institute for the captioning for the deaf. And I still had that um, that umatic um, copy in my office when I left ABC, and I took it with me. And Good. then I gave it to Richard Haynes, who transferred it to DVD for me. So I have. I have, a, I have two really nice DVDs 
it's standard def. I mean, they don't hold up so much today, but I have DVDs of that movie, of that TV show, and nobody has it. So, the people I go down to, it. so I go down to the set of Solaris, right? With the George Clooney reboot. Yeah. And Soderbergh directed that. And, you know, he knows Weintraub. He knew Weintraub really well. And somehow he comes up and Ocean's Eleven comes up. We had, I forget what the connection was, but he said, you. <laughs> well, you probably can't tell what you want to tell me what the connection is before I get into this. Go ahead. Um, Ocean's Eleven, they wanted to shoot it on location in Las Vegas. Right. Oh, there you go. Um, they, they did all their prep and, and all that stuff there, but they couldn't get into a casino. Mm-hmm. So they called Jerry Weintraub. And so that's how Jerry became one of the producers. Jerry Weintraub made a couple of phone calls and suddenly they're in the Bellagio. Right. Wow. So Vegas. that is exactly the story. And it's funny because uh, Clooney and Soderbergh tell it a little bit differently. They were like, uh, Weintraub goes around went around telling him he had a friend here and he had a friend there. He's got a friend in the shipping business. He's got a friend in the textile business. He's got a friend who's a butcher and has an Oklahoma farm. He's got all this. Right. And they keep thinking like you and your friends, like shut up, you know, like it's like, you know, cause it's like a Hollywood town. Right. And then all of a sudden they're in Vegas and Weintraub says, go see my friend. He's going to set you up. And I guess it was the shot where the guy runs from the casino with the money and gets gunned down. That's one of the shots before they got to the Bellagio, and they and and George Clooney's like, "Son of a bitch does have a friend who can get us." Like they were like, yeah. they were yeah. kind of like it was like they, they thought it was the kid crying wolf, and then all of a yeah. sudden it turned out to be real. And yeah. uh, and Jerry's in the movie. Jerry's in the yeah. have in the poker game they're having. Yeah, you know, yeah. hey kid, you better you know they're talking about the 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 character Andy Garcia plays, you know, Hey kid, you better have, you know, whatever. And then one of the other guys playing poker is John and John's last name escapes me, but he was the head of the legal department at Warner brothers. <laughs> He's really? Who? Oh God. He, he retired. Not John Schneider. Yeah. Was that... Oh, you gotta be uh, well, kidding no, me. I don't, not, not Schneider. I don't Larry, Larry, there was Larry Schneider. He was an accounting. Larry Schneider John, was down in the bridge John's building. Right? Schlesinger or John, something like that. John, um, yeah, he was the head legal guy, <laughs> and he's funny. in the movie. He's in That's the movie. So funny with, yeah. with Jerry Weintraub, you know, and yeah. and a bunch of friends, I guess. You know, Jerry's friends. I remember when I was just starting out, I had to drop something off at his office, and he <laughs> was telling a guy who's like, "God, Mister Weintraub, I wish somebody in his office is visiting. Goes, I wish I had a camera so I can uh, take a photo with you." And he goes, "Well." Uh, you, you can come back tomorrow with the camera, but I won't be here. But you know what you can do? You can shoot a photo of this empty lobby and tell them that Jerry Weintraub was here. <laughs> <laughs> or some version of that. Oh like you could shoot a photo of an empty lobby and tell him I walked <laughs> through it. You know, it's like <laughs> I remember Jerry, Jerry and Mark Solomon were like that. I bet. I'd go, I'd go into meetings. Um, they'd already be there. Jerry would just drop in, you know. Like you would mm. drop into Milius, okay? Yeah, Jerry yeah, would yeah. drop into Mark, 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 you know? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Mark Schoon can do Jerry great. That No, you do a pretty, that's a pretty good Jerry. Mark, Mark, you know, I don't want to talk to these other guys over here. You're the only guy I want to talk to. You know, but, but you know, Mark was really, really good. The key to keeping these producers close to you is that you you arrange to meet with them before you start production or when you're going over the budgets and stuff. And you quietly tell them when you're alone, you say, I'm here to help you realize your vision for this movie. Exactly. You you come to me, no matter what you need, you just come to me. We'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. You know? And then they feel like they have somebody. And then they have, then they feel like they have somebody working with them because, because the production guys are always bitching and moaning about it. Did you know, like your first day of production, you know, you you know, this mark, the first day of production, it's always some stupid shot. It's a drive by or somebody's walking into a door. So just so that they can say they got the first shot done, they, that, you know, they, they're, um, they want to be set up the first day of any production. You know, you're, you're going to have your makeup and all that, you know, six o'clock calls, but everybody has seven o'clock. You want to get your first shot by 815. If you can do your first shot by 815, you know, you've got it. You yeah. know, and then they're not bugging you. 
but all during production, you've got Draper and Schoon and and Defaria and Smith, wait, just calling you constantly. When the hell are you going? What, you can get your first shot yet? What's going on? You know, you guys behind? What, what, what's the produ- what's the production report going to say tomorrow when when I get it? And they're they're always complaining about the money and stuff like that. And the thing about post, um, up to a point, up till Bob and Terry left, the thing about post was like Bob and Terry, their philosophy was you budget what you believe this movie is going to cost to make. That's your budget. You budget what it's good. You can't budget mistakes. You can't budget redos. You budget what you think this is going to cost. And if, and if something happens, then you make a decision about whether you want to invest more money into it. Okay. When I left Warner brothers, it's been 10 years now. Um, when I, they were, they were thinking about reshoots before they'd even start. And, and that's a yeah. sign that they, that the prep wasn't fully finished or the script really isn't completely there, but they had an ambitious agenda mm. at Warner brothers. They had 24 movies a year. You know, we, we didn't make all of them ourselves, but th- we were putting out 24 movies a year. So you could get two from Joel, you know, dark castle, and you could get uh, one or two from Alcon and you'd get maybe something from legendary and something from um, Bel Air when they were there or, um, or village roadshow. And then the rest of them you have to do yourself. So it was an ambitious agenda. So and then Bob and Terry also understood that if it doesn't work, you have to fix it. And Bob would have this thing. I remember specifically with oh no, I'm I'm thinking the Avengers, but it wasn't that. It was another movie where Bob said, What have we got right now? This this movie is a failure. Okay. What what is it going to take to fix it? Okay. If if I if we put two million dollars into this to fix it, what would we have? Would we take the F to a C or would the F go to an A? Okay, if the F is going to go to an A, then I'm going to put the two million dollars into it. But if it only gets me to you know a D plus or a C minus, then it's not worth putting the money into it. You know, mm-hmm. we'll just put it out in a smaller thing and, you know, try to recoup what we can. And we and we've got this Warner Home Video division that needs material. So we would do that. So Bob and Terry understood that stuff needed sometimes needed to get fixed. It was we didn't have a blank check and post, you know, but later, I don't think Jeff Robinoff ever sort of got that because um, he would complain about everything. You know, Jeff would. um Jeff would, you know, we we would agree to a thing. He would say, "Okay, this movie. I don't want to name names, but this movie. Okay, this is seventy. This is seventy eight million dollars. Seventy eight million dollars is what we're going to spend to make this movie. You know, and that's on the Tuesday meeting. The next Tuesday, okay, sixty four million dollars. It's like, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. We just we budgeted all this. We've got it. We we met your goal. No, no, it's sixty four million dollars now. That's the kind of shit he would do. <laughs> okay, I think I know the movie you're talking about. Very I don't mean to interrupt. Even, very few are even worth the sixty-four million. I gotta say, they overspent and overproduced a lot of stuff. Well, I I love that in your explanation, you cited the Bel Air production outfit because that was my outfit. And the media, something interesting happened when you said it. I was hearing you talk, and I go, I wonder if we would have been able to live up to that commitment that he just cite, paraphrased there. Two movies. I mean, because Bel Air was so dysfunctional. Yeah, uh, you know, and the thing is that the, not to not to cast aspersions. You know, because I always liked Steve Ruther. I always liked him. He was heading up, um, he was head of production for Regency when Regency was on the lot. And I liked Steve. And Steve was one of the adults over there at Regency. Um, I always liked Steve Ruther and I I thought he was a good guy. Um, But Bel Air Entertainment, and and I, I don't say this with any glee, but everything Bel Air Entertainment touched failed. You don't have to tell me that, bro. I was there for a lot of that. And yeah. uh, and, it was and, these were, and some, some of these there. were good concepts, too. Yeah. Pay it forward. And uh, Proof of Life was the big mess. Well, when proof, I, with Russell was, Bob Daly said that that was going to suffer when, when it came out that um, Meg Ryan and um, her co-star were having an affair. Mm-hmm. And it got out. 
and um and then it and then it became oh look at she broke dennis quaid's heart and oh my god and that and um who's the guy what's his name <laughs> okay la russell confidential Crow. russell, russell crow and russell crow was like sort of the bad but the bad boy of hollywood you know he's always getting into fights and stuff he's mm-hmm. throwing stuff at people and he threw a phone at somebody and got sued and had the because he hit somebody in the face like in a hotel or something with a phone do you hear yeah, that I story i have heard i've heard that also with uh scott rudin um, you know, I never encountered Scott Rudin. I think we did one movie with him, but I don't even remember him. I I don't remember him at all. And then Mark, anyone, then all Mark, my stories throw... come out, and it's like, oh my god, you know. Mark, but, anyone uh, ever but, throw a phone but, at you? You know, but but I was just it was just a shame. It was just a shame that um, the Bel Air stuff never clicked, and it wasn't the fault of any of the people there, except they did they make that one movie with Cooper Gooding Jr. that the studio wouldn't accept. They made a movie. We were supposed to distribute it, and we wouldn't take it. What was Remember it? Remember that Carol Dantuano had a small little like window card poster of it in her office. I, uh, I love Carol Dantuano, by the way. Oh, I thought she too. was fantastic. Uh, but too. I'm trying to think what movie it was, and it might have been when I wasn't there. It might have been before my time. I can't recall it. I mean, Proof of Life was our big mess. Oh, but what was? It, yeah. What's funny it. is at the time that was going on, and we were trying to figure out the cut and. Alan Horn wanted it one way and Russell Crowe was being really difficult about yeah. the cut, really difficult in an unnecessary way. Um, no, but Dennis Alan Quaid wasn't there. It was Bob. It was Bob Daly was there. Bob said that's I think Bob was there. What no, was I'm that? pretty sure this would have been Alan Horn. I think I think we're okay. we're, we're blurring our timelines because I I wasn't I wasn't there until Horn started. OK. So, so, it, so what happened was, so we had a projectionist who, um, he was our main projectionist in the Steve Ross theater. He used to project for Bob at his home, you know, the Bel Air circuit stuff. He mm-hmm. used to come in and he would tell me, he would have these conversations with Bob about the stuff. And then he'd come back. You remember Rick, don't you, um, Mark, Rick in the, yeah. in the Ross theater. So. He would tell me conversations he was having with um, with Bob. I don't know if he was going back to Bob and telling him conversations he was having with me, but he would tell me. And and Bob commented that 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 the bad publicity on Proof of Life was going to hurt the box office, and the box office was not good. Now whether that was is what did it in because it was a decent movie. It was a little long. Who directed that? Okay, so that was Taylor Hackford, but oh god, okay. You say decent, and I think you're being generous. I thought that film could have been way better. The script could have been, been. it could have been, but that's so. Why, you know, when it got barraged, there really wasn't a lot there to to fight over because it wasn't. I didn't think it was that great. But the whole so that idea of it, but the whole idea of it was good great. idea. It was a good idea. Yeah, and for sure. The um, and the, I was watching dailies, and the Russell Crowe stuff was was good enough he he sounded expert enough he was believable he was convincing and believable Mm -hmm. um meg ryan was um hot as could be and what's his name what's his name is his sidekick uh csi uh that guy who played hack in uh that tv show nypd blue right who was it caruso caruso's the co-star was caruso in that yeah and but then what's the guy, for... the guy who played Hack on the yeah. ABC show, um, he's been in a million things. Tom, 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 something. Um, he was in it. There, I mean, it had, it had the makings of a hit. Um, and I don't, I don't know who you blame that on. I liked the movie. It's too long. I think it's too long. It's, a, it's a little um, overindulgent. And I, I would lay that at Taylor Hackford's feet personally. I just don't you know, think there's enough to it. I don't think there's enough action I elements like, to hold me yeah, personally. Yeah. I like Taylor, you know, and, and believe it or not, you know, I'm, I'm one of these people who goes around saying all the time, you know, when you buy a director's cut, you're not getting a director's cut. You're getting a reimagining of this. Everybody thinks somehow the studios just want to ruin everybody's movie by cutting stuff out. And then, and then they try to correct themselves with a director's cut. The, the kind of the, the the um zach snyder narrative on justice league mm-hmm. you know but the thing is that zach 
under the most horrible circumstances you can imagine. So I, it, so I don't, you know, I'm not making light right, of this, right. but he, he had to abandon the project while it was um, nearing completion. And, um, but he, but Zach is always out there about, oh, and my version is this and that. And then he convinced somebody at the studio to do his version. He's got his legion of fans, you know, and all this stuff. But um, with one exception, every movie we did, the director's cut is not, not as good. Mm. I mean, they were improved by showing it to the studio, getting notes, going out to audiences, you know, they were the stuff that got cut out of Harry Potter should have been cut out. And it's, and a lot of the stuff, not all of the things that, that required a whole lot of visual effects are not there, but there are scenes from the first Harry Potter that made it onto the DVD in their extra material. And it's like, yeah, that stuff doesn't belong in the movie. It's, it, it, you know, okay. Yeah. It's nice to see. Okay. The, this is a part they trimmed and all that. The one exception and, and I don't blame the studio for handling it the way they did was Devil's Advocate, which Taylor Hackford directed. Yeah. Um, that director's cut is so much better. The original director's cut is so much better than what that movie ended up being. The movie ended up being really good. But there was there, there were things they they modified along the way because they they were afraid of really frightening the audience you know at these cuz all the people who worked for that law firm were were like demons and stuff and like they they um they there's a scene where um oh my god i'm blanking on his name the actor who was in beetlejuice who played the father jeffrey jones jeffrey jones right. is that his name yeah yeah okay he plays um, he plays a character Eddie something and he is brutally beaten to death in Central Park, and, um, and the studio didn't want that in there because it was just so so violent it was you know but I remember talking to Mark Warner who, we were leaving the screening we did a we did a screening in Westwood at the old UA Cinema Complex they had on Westwood Boulevard south of Wilshire mm -hmm. um, it's not there anymore it's a CVS I think. Um, and I'm walking through the parking lot with Mark and I said, you know, that scene with Eddie needs to go back in. This thing is so weak without it. You know, this guy, this guy has made, he's in league with the devil. There needs to be retribution. I think the audience is going to buy into retribution. They did put his, the beating of him in there, but it wasn't nearly as like brutal as it had been. But I think Taylor's instincts were exactly correct on that movie. I would love to see. I would advocate, <laughs> you know, pardon the pun. I would advocate for a real director's cut of The Devil's Advocate, you know. But I don't uh, think Taylor wants to get on that road again, you know. Oh, I, I bet you he could. I bet you he could be enticed to do it. I remember we came across him at, uh, we found him at the Standard. He was at Twiggy, Twiggy Ramirez's birthday party, the guitarist for Marilyn Manson. And he kept telling us about how the devil's advocate did so well overseas, you know, that famous line, right? And, and in this party writer, Vince Vaughn and Benicio del Toro that are just rolling their eyes at the famous, it did really well overseas, but I, I bet you could probably talk them it might into have. coming back. Yeah. yeah. They had big stars. You had Keanu in it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, we, Connie and, Nielsen was in it and Charlize Theron. It's the first time I ever saw Charlize Theron. And, and wouldn't it I be, see her because she's yeah. naked in half the movie. Um, yeah. And wouldn't it be interesting, though, to revisit it all these years later and kind of see what creative stitch work they can do on it? I don't know. If you were to ask Taylor, um, he would he would tell you maybe in a pompous way, you know, but it, but certainly I don't mean it that way. I mean, it, Taylor would tell you, yes, that director's cut was way, way better than what the studio put out. Mm -hmm. And he's right. It was, it was way, way, way better. And if you ask Mark Warner, the editor, he would probably say the same thing. I don't know what um, ideas Mark might have about it now. Um, but it was, um, yeah, it was just an incredible movie just in so many ways. Making it was an incredible experience and, and, um, there you go, Mark, and, and all that. Yeah, Mark's walking out of the interview now. He's had well, enough. He's, of... he's calling um, Uber Eats, I think. <laughs> Is it? No, he said so, he had to do something about dinner. He was arranging for dinner, so I have to do that too because we're go obviously you guys are fun to talk to, and we're running long. 
The one director's cut I will make immediate allowances for that comes to mind as I think being an improvement was for Mark's old boss, Spielberg, when they did Close Encounters and they put the scene with the ghost ship in the desert back into the movie. And Joe Alves and I talked about that shot did quite they? a bit and how that was a what? model. Yeah. Do you remember that, Mark? I mean, yeah, it wasn't. Uh, it was actually a new shot. Did they go do a new shot of that? Yeah. Because I remember that what I saw, um, the reimagined thing showed the interior of the ship, which we never saw. Right. In, There's uh, that in the original movie. You know, right, that and was then, shot of course, for on ET, they go back and they take the guns out of the hands of the FBI agents and put flashlights in their hands. Remember yeah, that big mistake, which, big mistake. They, which they restored again back to what it was, yeah, back to the guns. Uh, it's what just... were you going to say about the final shot of Close Encounters, Mark? Uh, that was actually also shot, uh, was a new shot mm. that Stephen uh ended up regretting doing that. He did it because. Columbia gave him a million dollars to shoot it, you know, mm -hmm. the, the new scenes. And, and, uh, but so there's several versions of close encounters, but the authentic version is the one that does not, where Dreyfus doesn't go into the mothership. Right. Hey, I'm Alex from Quiet Riot. I'm Dizzy from Guns N' Roses. I'm Johnny from Typo Negative. I'm Mike from what? Help us cure NMOSD and, and with, with it, it cancer. cancer. Go to the Make the World a Better Place Foundation and donate now. Yeah. Well, he does. He go, does go up the ramp. The original version I saw, he goes up that ramp, but we never see the inside. He goes in. Right. Right. Exactly. And that's been that's the yeah. the official version now. You know, it's so well, funny. When I saw that movie, they were um, everybody was talking about it. I was new to town. I was relatively new to L.A. And everybody was talking about this movie. And then the the um, the big poster they had, the mm -hmm. billboard on Sunset Boulevard, and it just happened to be right at that turn. And you make that turn, and it fills up your windshield because it's it's on the turn. And then, of course, you know you keep going, and it's like it was clever, really, really clever piece of marketing to put it on that billboard. But they did um, they were advertising that it was going to play at the Cinerama Dome. And they did a sneak preview the week, the movie before they did a sneak preview of something they, and they didn't say what it was. The sneak preview of some movie was that's coming here is going to be playing. And it ended up being this, a big movie, whatever was the big movie before um, the close encounters. So then the Cinerama dome has it again, another sneak preview a week before Close Encounters is supposed to come out. They do another sneak preview and all these people are lined up to go see it thinking that lightning's going to strike twice here. They're going to, you know, this will be Close Encounters. It then ended up being Kentucky Fried Movie. <laughs> on, talk about a punch in the face. You know, you know that billboard, I, I know from some of my Budweiser contacts that that billboard was about 75K a month in the 90s. So I can well pretty close, much we're talking about 77 going into 78. Is that right, Mark? Mm -hmm. Close encounters. Uh yeah, December 77. Yeah. Because I, I remember going to see it at the Cinerama Dome. I'd gone to work. Um I was working at ABC at the time. I'd gone to work and then I um I went from work to um the Cinerama Dome and got in line um with a friend of mine from Pennsylvania. And we saw the movie together. That's at a time when I really thought the Cinerama Dome was a great venue. You know, I've since come off that uh, point of view, but um, it was just amazing. I, I think the problem with the Cinerama Dome is that it doesn't match up to the audio that we have today. That The shape of it doesn't really enhance the audio experience. It's a great picture mm -hmm. and all that. And if you're just doing it in Dolby Stereo, then... You know the helicopters coming in on on um, apocalypse now yeah. really works the way it reverberates around the room, but that room is not made for seven or eight track um, Dolby Digital or SDDS or whatever is out there or Dolby Atmos. You know, it's just it there's too much bouncing around of the sound. So yeah. real quick, real quick, we talked about the we were discussing whether or not Eastwood taking a golf club to somebody's windshield is a real story based on how we perceived Eastwood to be when we were at Warner Brothers. That was, you know, detective file number one. But the other one that I wanted to ask Mark about 
if you could shed some light on it, one of the model makers on a closing counters was pointing to it to me and said, that's where we put a little C3PO and R2D2. Mm -hmm. on um, just because, R2D2. Was it just an R2D2? He said something about yeah. we put some Star Wars props on it and no one ever noticed, but you know about it, obviously. Yeah, it's when the uh, mothership is rising. Um, it's a close shot. Uh, mm -hmm. Melinda Dillon is looking at the ship as it's rising above Devil's Tower, and, and uh, you can see R2. I mean, they put it in a lot of things. Uh, uh, R2 was on the ship in Goonies. Uh, Wait, where? Uh, uh, on the pirate ship. You don't see it. It's on the model. I've got a picture I'll send to you. Would you that. please send me that? I'd love to I, see that. Is that a class in, um, Indiana Jones yeah. too, right? And some of the hieroglyphics. Yeah. yeah, the hieroglyphics of R2 and 3PO. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, my only experience with, my first experience with the Cinerama Dome, I think, was the crew screening of Godzilla. Um, and I remember walking in with a woman from Sony Publicity who warned me and said, basically, once you see this and you hate it, <laughs> don't say anything till we're out of here. And I was like, great salesmanship. I'm all about it. Now, Al Leong. Al Leong actually sat next to me, but we didn't know each other yet. That's so funny because he's a stuntman in it. But once you see it and you hate it, don't say anything until we're having margaritas someplace. Wow. Yeah, I love it. You know, I think she knew something about the film. that Every time, yeah. I never invited people to movies that I thought might fail. You know, every time I would invite people and it was usually when we were checking prints mm -hmm. um, on weekends. Because my boss, Amy Harrington and Mark Solomon just hated it when I invite people, you know, to see some of these movies and stuff. And, um, but, you know, so on a week, they were never going to come in on a weekend if they could help it, you know, but I was always there. I just loved working at a studio. I was always there. Mm -hmm. um, but I brought my brother-in-law in to see The Matrix and and I he hadn't heard of it, you know. And I said to him, "Look, there's no way I can describe this movie to you in a way that would make you want to see it. But take my word for it, you have never seen or heard anything like this before." So I arranged the uh, because we were bicycling reels around the studio to you know to the to the Ross to five to twelve and to twenty one. And because uh, we were we were checking all four of the formats and we would do STDS first because that was the most likely to fail because um, it was on the edges, the outer edges. So if it um, if it got scratched up on the take up or going through the gate, it might fail. So you do it first. So it has so it, it already hasn't had any wear and tear, you know, right. as you're checking these. Mark Mark's familiar with all this. Mm. Um and so I sat my brother-in-law in room 12. I purposely did it in 12. We did SDDS first. That Why was the 12? only that Why was screening room 12. Because that's where that was the one uh, above me, wasn't it? That's where Bel Air was. Right. Um, that's why. And <laughs> uh because and then that was the only theater there, the only screening room that got the movie in continuity. Mm -hmm. Reels one through eight or nine, whatever it was. I think it was eight reels. Um, so they got it in continuity and he sat with Julia Evershade. So she sat, she was one of the, the sound senior, like sound editors. She, she sat where the console was and I had Brian, my brother-in-law sit um, about four rows ahead of her in the middle. Okay. And, and we ran SDDS there on, pur on purpose because I wanted him to hear that. And, um, SDDS is very heavy with subwoofers, very, very bassy that. And so when that helicopter hit that building, the room shook, mm. that whole room shook. Now I always did my SDDS stuff in room 12 because there was some bitch at Bel Air Entertainment Here we wouldn't go. let us walk through the reception there <laughs> to get from one side of the building to the other. And we were restricted from doing that. So I, I think I know sure, that bitch you're talking about. I made sure that that building shook every time we did a movie, yeah. every time yeah. we screened something in there just for the Bel Air people. Okay. And that's before any eggnog. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, you know, yeah, I'm a pretty good guy and I'm fun and all that stuff. But I can be vindictive too. I know how to be a prick without anybody realizing it. 
What I want to know is um, if it well, what we'll find out is if all of a sudden um, wearable silk pajamas show up for all of us at Christmas, we'll know Joel Silver approved of the interview here. <laughs> if, if anyone gets a box, report it to the other people yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm gonna. Uh, oh, then we'll God. know how. Then we'll yeah. know if we're still on Joel yeah. Silver's good side. But uh, <laughs> uh, do you remember someone? So here, you know. But here's the upshot with my brother-in-law. He couldn't talk about that movie enough, and he was probably responsible for a couple of hundred admissions. Not for him, but all the people he told to for go sure. see this movie because he's a total Trekkie and, mm -hmm. and total science nerd and stuff like that. Um, and I knew I just I knew that if he liked it then we knew this was going to be a huge hit. And he right. just couldn't say enough about that movie. And it, that was my response to you about, you know, if you hate this movie, don't, don't talk about it, you know, cause I would never, I would never even let somebody see it. I never took anybody to see the Avengers. So there, well, okay. okay. The Avengers <laughs> is another story, but before we go down that rabbit hole, there was a cast member from a matrix one that was supposed to do matrix two, but didn't because he tried to get on the lot. And confront Silver about his deal. Do you remember that? No. Yeah. And Who would it if be? you wonder, what's that? Who would it be? Well, he's the one cast member. I can't remember his character name. I haven't seen the movie in two decades. But he's the one cast member who survives. He was supposed to come they, back for part two. Yeah, they all. I mean, the second one and the third one. They, I think they all came back. Joey Pants didn't, but but he gets killed in um in the first one. Speaking of yeah. Mark's buddy. Yeah. And Joey wouldn't do that anyway. Joey wouldn't do that. Joey's a good yeah. guy. It's yeah, not Joey. It's not Joey. I think it's the actor. Was it the character Tank, I think, that did it? There was uh, a character Tank. There were two. Um, they're brothers yeah. in the movie, right? Yeah, it, it's I, possible. It's one of them. I, I'd have to go back and look. But you know what? I'm I'm burned out on The Matrix. I just. I. Me too, man. I just am. It's um, been there, done that. It was great when we did it. I have fond memories of it, um, but I know what it's. I it's. I feel kind of the same way about Harry Potter, because I I can sit and watch it, and I know where the where the changeovers are in the reels, <laughs> even though you can't see them on 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 the DVDs and stuff. You know, yeah. I I know where all the real changes are. That's how well I know these movies. You know, wait, and, let's. And, and, isn't that Christmas? Isn't that Christmas viewing for you guys? Harry Potter, don't you guys sit back and screen it with your families? Mark, don't you still watch that movie? Or are uh, you guys you're trying to forget about it? No, I it's I love the movie. It's just uh, it's that there's nothing else to watch, maybe, but um, if it, you know, if I'm flipping channels, you know, if I'm scrolling through the satellite dish and, and see channel, you know, channels, um, and I see it on there, um, nine times out of ten I will tune in. Mm -hmm. um first of all i'm curious to see whether they're running at scope or 185 because like hbo totally runs all that stuff 185 which i think is a crime yeah that we we purposely made those movies um well super 35 but the, it translates into scope on on the theater screen uh we purposely did those movies in 2.35 to 1 with seven track uh, Dolby Digital and eight track SDDS. We did that on purpose because these movies were designed to be events. Mm. These were event movies for us. And uh, the only thing missing would be a, an intermission, you know, from from like roadshow type movies. You know, that's for me. This was like the studios Ben Hur and Cleopatra, except that it didn't bomb, like Cleopatra. These were intended to be event movies. There was so much anticipation. Those books were so beloved. And we purposely made them bigger than they needed to be. So when I see HBO basically, you know, latching onto the center of the picture and doing it in 185, it just, I, I'm offended by that. So a lot of times I'll check to see. Um, HBO still does that. But if, I, but if it plays on Stars or Encore or, or uh, doesn't play on Showtime. But stars are on core sci-fi channel. Um, they play. Why doesn't it um, play on Showtime? Generally, um, Showtime was Viacom, and they do mostly Paramount movies and stuff like that. They never made a deal. You don't see a whole lot of Time Warner product on Showtime. I mean, you can. It's possible, but you don't really see a whole lot because HBO pretty much locked all that up. They made a deal with Disney on the first two movies. Uh, they made a TV deal with Disney 
for before the first Harry Potter was uh, completed, before it was still in post, but before it was out, they made a deal. They sold um, the TV rights, broadcast TV rights to ABC television for the first two movies for $150 million. So before anybody saw a single frame, before there was an answer print, that movie was already in the black. Well, nice. Well, <laughs> you know, that's nice. So, that's uh, that's the goal, right? <laughs> you know, so um, you know that they, um, you know, so I do, and I like Chris's movies. I mean, I I hate it when I hear people say, "Oh, those Chris Columbus movies are so they're too bright, they're too cheerful," oh. and it's like they're it's they're kids. I mean, it's it's All at right. least I can see the picture. And then they keep saying that, um, well, you know, they get darker because stories get darker. No, they get darker because they're hiding the imperfections and the visual effects. It's all about. So, OK, that effects. makes sense. So speaking of Chris Columbus and we've talked about just about everyone, we've talked about everyone from Russell Crowe to Steve Ross to Clint Eastwood to the Warshawskis to Milius being the Warshawskis therapist to Joel Silver, hopefully sending us all silk pajamas for the holidays. <laughs> um, speaking of, uh, I that's have one Joel. question. Yeah, that's Joel. Is he calling you now? <laughs> Saying, where do I get a hold of this motherfucker in the top right? Anyway, um, real quick, uh, Mark, I had a question for you, because and Bill mentioned Chris Columbus, so there's a crossover. Robert's Blossom, the actor. Mm-hmm. Somebody asked me how he was because he comes across so he came across so authentic. And I actually said, I don't know. I've never, I never worked on anything or was even close to that guy, but I know who was. And it was Mark Marshall because you worked with him on an amazing stories. Yes, Ghost Train. So the he was in a home alone, right? He's the guy that uh Cole can, you know encourages to take a step towards reconstituting his family it's actually a pretty nice moment oh, the, the old yeah guy, the old guy in the yeah in the church okay yeah yeah now what you know the sad th- face what a great character face for the i movies. know man talk about a guy why do i picture he was probably like a up like a stuck stuntman with yakima canuck like back in the 40s <laughs> and 50s you know like jumping this the horse tr- like team on the stagecoach you know but anyway give me a quick Give me a quick. St- he was also in the Carpenter film Christine. You know, he's kind of ominous. He's he's got he had some gravitas that guy. But do you have a story about him? Well, he's also in Close Encounters. Um, yes, and he's, he's great. UFO, he's yeah, who holds up a sign and says, "Stop and be friendly." But he's um, the guy who saw Bigfoot. He confesses yeah, to seeing yeah, Bigfoot. Yeah, saw Bigfoot once. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, Roberts was very. Um, he he was a gentleman. He was very quiet. He he observed a lot, listened a lot. And when Stephen would give him directions, he would just nod his head and he would go and do it. He was just a, a true gentleman and a pleasure to be around. There was no ego about him. Uh, not at all. He was a great team player. A journeyman. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. That's, that's what Jimmy Cagney always aspired to be, just a journeyman. That is like the old guard. Yeah. He is good in closing. Yeah, He's good in Home Alone, too. You know. I'm, I'm remotely involved with Home Alone. Oh well, then look, let's let's have the Home Alone Christmas episode story from you, <laughs> and then we got to sign well, off before this show hits the four hour mark. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> Home Alone, of course, was a Warner Brothers project, and yeah. the genesis of it was that um, um, John Hughes called Bob Daly and said, "I have this movie." And it, but it's a Christmas movie, something for you to fit in for the end of the year it, or something that that's how the conversation went. I'm paraphrasing. And Bob said, we only have $5 million because we, we would, we would start out with a, a fund to make our movies. So if you were doing something really big, you wanted to get your green light first, you know, first of the year, yeah. when you still had money to make your movie, you know? So Bob said, it's $5 million. And um, can you do that? And John Hughes said, yeah, we, yes, absolutely. We can do that. And then they're, then they're shooting the movie and all this. And then, uh, or no, they haven't shot the movie yet. They're prepping, they're prepping to do the movie. They've got their offices open in Chicago and everything. And then suddenly it's $7 million. And Bob is like, no, we can't do, you know, it, it's a movie where the lead is a nine-year-old kid and who's nobody's nobody's heard of and that's the lead of your movies in almost every scene of the movie 
you know, so that that's already a risk. But Bob was okay, five million dollars. Yeah, we can do that. But it ended up being seven million dollars, and Bob had to pass on it. And then um, immediately, John had called um, Fox, and Fox said, "Yeah, we'll do it." And so, literally, they didn't even change offices. They had the same office space. The Warner Brothers signs came off the doors, and Fox signs came back on, and and Fox did that movie. Now I was at Lorimar at the time. And Lorimar was owned by Warner. So we were hearing these stories. And then I that same year, I was in Chicago doing Gabriel's Fire, a series with James Earl Jones. And I'm hearing the stories from all Wait, the crew. Wait, the Coleman Luck show? Yeah. Yeah, I did that. Oh, Coleman is going to be so happy. He finally gets a mention on this. Oh, I my God. Coleman Luck. Coleman Luck was the greatest. Well, Absolutely he's... Absolutely the greatest. He's right there. He's still here for you to talk to. But anyway, jump over that. So Hurdle. Um, he went, you know, I did the pilot. I went to Chicago and did the pilot. I was there for a couple months. Mm -hmm. um, and then we came back to L.A. That's how I ended up in Burbank. That's how I ended up at Warner Brothers. Because we came back. To, we came back to L.A. My office was at MGM. I get called into my boss's office and she says, look, Bill, uh, we don't have space for you here on our lot. And we and there's no space at Culver Studios. You're going to have to go to Burbank. And I didn't let on at the time, but I was ecstatic about it because it cut my commute in half. I was living in Arcadia. It was a 14 mile drive for me to Burbank and a 26 mile drive for me through downtown to get to Culver City. A so, reasonable. Oh, wait, hold up. That's a reasonable cut in your commute. But you made me think of Gary Marshall, who didn't want to go all the way to disney because it was too far from silver well anyway, did we the from, gary zone it was the gary yeah, zone right, the gary so zone. when gary came to warner brothers because he had been working at disney yeah yeah because yeah. he lived in toluca lake disney was so far disney, and he was so happy to come to warner brothers where he saved a, a half mile of his yeah. journey that extra 600 <laughs> yards is a yeah. long way to yeah. drive anyway anyway thanks gary so but um so i was hearing the stories from my crew in chicago at, at most especially um, because I was the production auditor, so I hired a local accountant, and um, and then later I hired her, the woman who was her boss when she was doing the Fox thing. Um, I don't think she did. I don't believe she did Home Alone, but all the, all everybody knew what was going on with Home Alone, and then uh, later. Um, so that that movie made half a billion dollars at the box office. Like, yeah, who knew? crushed it, you know, sort of thing. Um, but that was a that was a Warner Brothers project, and then later we did a couple things with John Hughes, and um, he used to do shit to us just to, you know. And I always had a feeling if that he did that seven million dollar thing on purpose, that he, you know, I don't know what the deal was with him, and and um, I never encountered him. I've seen him from a distance, but I never talked to him or anything like that. But I I have these real negative memories of him you know so um i'm one of the people who didn't really mourn him when he passed away because i he he was he was in the bad boy column he was he was he was he was, he was on the naughty list mm -hmm. um since it's christmas he was on the naughty list um but we did um we did curly sue with him total fucking piece of shit movie in every way i mean i i met some really wonderful people working on that movie they they did it in chicago but but i was in la doing the production accounting for them but you know and he he would do shit he just he drove bruce berman crazy with the stuff so i always wondered if if john didn't engineer that seven million dollar thing and always because it sure went to fox fast you know and i yeah that's just what i was like, thinking engineer that just to embarrass Bob and Terry, and I don't know what Bob and Terry might have done because they were the nicest people to work with, and from my perspective, and, and they were the bosses, you know. But they weren't; mm -hmm. they didn't behave like the boss. They were way more polite than even Steve Papazian was, and Steve Papazian was fairly polite. You know, he's a bully, but he was fairly polite about it. You know, um, mm -hmm. I don't know. They, but anyway, I do. Uh... So I, I do have a little bit of information. I love Home Alone, though. I do love the movie. It's it's just great. And that <sighs> went a long way. I don't know what interaction Bob and Terry had with Chris when Chris was prepping that movie. Um, but Chris was one of the people, an early person they went to when they were looking for a director because they wanted someone. The, the primary thing was someone who could work with kids. 
they did go to Steven. Steven had a whole different idea how to do it. Mm. He wanted to do an animated feature. And of course, DreamWorks at the time, you know, were trying to bolster their animation thing. And there was no way we were going to go with that. We oh, you're talking about you're shifting to Potter now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm, I mean, because Chris, Chris did Potter, you know. Right. So, right. I, I, so I yeah. They, so the, 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 so Home Alone had a lot to do with why Chris Columbus got hired to do Harry Potter. And, you know, and you can criticize Chris all you want. I mean, he only did the two movies, but um, he was the guy who made all the decisions about the sets, the casting, the costumes. Mm -hmm. He created the world. The magic, you know, and uh, we have a lot to thank him for. No doubt. But we're going to have to get to more of the in-depth thank yous next time because we're losing the light and it's going to be three black screens I know, look at talking. me. I'm, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I've only got light. The light, you know, this light behind me will turn on. Hold on uh, one as, second. Hold on one as second. As always. No, watch, no. Watch gonna... this. No, 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 no. Uh, Put on your Christmas tree lights, for God's sakes. I'm going to mute it so sakes. I don't blow your ears out. There you go. That was my... um. Amazon Echo. It's I can call out the name <laughs> and uh, tell it to put the light on. And then when I want to turn it off, I just call out that name again and I say good night and it and you hear a polite okay. <laughs> and then <laughs> let me give you guys the final thoughts real quick. Mark, I'll start with you. Uh the holidays. Um holiday movies, anything holiday related you want to recommend or suggest? A little holiday cheer from you. Um you know, my go-to movie for Christmas is always Miracle on 34th Street. Um, everything else, and maybe the original version of Christmas Carol with Alice or Sam, but but um, everything else pales. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's with things going on right now, it's kind of hard to get into the spirit totally. So um, right. as Blaine and Martin said in, and the song have yourself a merry little christmas we'll just have to muddle through somehow so is that positive enough that is positive enough and we will we will muddle through somehow also incidentally alistair sim reprised the role i think you know in the animation that came out in the early 70s yes they brought him yeah. back that's the one where cratchit hits him with a snowball right is i think that yes. version, or is that the original owen so many people have done it but that Cratchit, that's the Alistair Sims, the guy that gets nailed with the snowball, and Cratchit has to apologize. There's that dynamic, I think. Yeah, and Cratchit is played by the guy who played the judge in uh, Miracle on 34th Street. Right, it comes back oh, around wow. to Miracle on 34th Street, which is, by oh. the way, one of the best movies ever made. Not just best yes. Christmas movies, but one of the best. That whole showdown between Macy and Gil first of all, the actor they got to play Macy is so good in that. He is. Um, but they, he's just. They cast. just yeah, you just believe it, but and especially when he fires the psychologist, you know, you're just rooting yeah. for that moment, and he just goes walks right through the courtroom and fires. But that showdown between him and Gimbal, where they're trying to like figure out how to pay for a uh, an X-ray machine and you can get it at cost, you know, it's like the just those great moments between those actors who, you know, in many cases, shell hammer. These guys were so yeah. good in those roles, you know, including the kid who was mopping up the janitorial kid who played Santa at the YMCA and. Just a brilliant, brilliant movie. And uh it's, and Edmund it's, Gwynn, the best yeah, Santa. Yeah. And he's he was good in everything he did. He's great in them. He did he he was a good, good actor, but agreed. A near perfect Santa Claus, as close as you the movies have ever been. I think that is as yeah. close as they've gotten to the perfect as much as I love Asner and Elf, Gwyn <laughs> is by far like the near perfect approach, I think. Wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Bill, you Christmas cheer never, from you. I've never seen Elf. Um, I'm surprised that actor. I can't stand Will okay. Ferrell. <laughs> and oh, except that he is great. The one movie that he is absolutely great in is Kicking and Screaming, the soccer movie. Okay. Yeah. yeah. He's great in that. Um, I like the Albert Finney musical Scrooge. So does my wife. She loves I it. I love that movie. Um, originally, that was Richard Harris was supposed to do that part. Did you know That's that? That's a good call, too. Wow. Um, they got Albert Finney to do it. Um, I I saw Wonka on Friday, I think. Mm. Um, it's it's worthwhile. 
it's not a great movie, but it's worthwhile. It's um, it's pretty cool. The the their take on, you know, the before he becomes before Willy Wonka becomes. So you can King recommend Wilder. it. I do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Wilder's so good. That my favorite version of Wonka actually is the Futurama version, when they go to the <laughs> Slurm Factory and the Oompa Loompas are singing the song like, "Where don't ask too many questions or you may get your leg broke." <laughs> you know and, and then the the next line is it can easily happen again to you yeah. folks <laughs> well um in, in in the latest iteration of wonka uh hugh grant plays um yeah. plays the uh oompa loompa you only see the okay. one oompa loompa okay um he's good i did i did like um roy when he did it for the johnny depp you know uh the charlie and the chocolate factory I just talked to him actually. That's funny oh, you yeah? mentioned him. Yeah. Oh, he it was he had such a look about mm -hmm. him. And then when they told us the idea, because what Tim wanted to do is all the Yumpalupas would be the same. And and they were all Roy. I mean, it was just like an amazing sort of thing, you know. Um, although the I found that movie to be creepy. I thought Johnny Depp was a yeah. little too Michael Jackson yeah. in that. <laughs> Yeah, 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 th yeah, that's what yeah. we. But that's what we were comparing him to because you know he had these fake teeth and stuff like that, and it was just yeah. a little creepy. But you know, you know, getting away from the creep factor for a moment, Deep Roy is an underappreciated actor. Um, he was great. He's, uh, he's, he's great, great in everything he does. And I and mm -hmm. I I cherished the time that I met him because of you. Mm -hmm. You know, because that was so cool. It was just so cool. Oh, there's uh, we spent so much time watching him. We we feel like we're with these people when we're watching dailies, you know, cause you, you are in a dark room and it's on a big screen and it's just you and the actors. Yeah. And Dee Dee Allen, you know? <laughs> so, D. D. Uh, D. Allen. Oh, I love Dee Dee Allen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Merry it's Christmas funny. to you guys. Oh yeah. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas to, you, to your families. Merry Christmas, Ethan. Thank you, Mark. We miss you, yeah. Bill. We, we you don't see enough too. of you there. Yeah. It is a different environment when Mark Marshall is not here. It's much more. <laughs> it's much more uh, festive. <laughs> no, no, no. It's more festive with you here, actually. And it's always festive when we get a chance to talk to Bill Daly. And I'm hoping that a messenger knocks on my door and says, silk pajamas, gold, extra large for you. <laughs> and then hopefully Joel Silver gets the joke. And on the back of the bathrobe that comes with him is a Chico Bales Bonds patch. <laughs> Just take pictures. Uh, no, because if it's it's coming to all of us, or all three boxes will come here, and I'll have to send them to you. But uh, yeah, and and of course the the Christmas card note in it will read, "You're right. I should have always fired those assholes." <laughs> that's the that's the Joel Silver story for another day. Never mind. Uh, but God bless you guys for your patience. As always, you as well. A blast to talk to. I did not think when we started this and the sun was up, we'd be talking three hours later. But of course, <laughs> it's a privilege. Uh, and I'll circle back with both of you uh, prior to the holiday and uh, pick up my Sounds Pele good. autographed soccer ball. Your Pele ball. Yeah. yeah. Got it ready. Yeah. Yeah. Anything in closing? Or are we all good? I we're think we're bad. good. Uh, best to your loved ones. Anything you need, please hit me up. I'm here for you. Merry well, okay, Christmas then. to you all. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Speak soon. Okay, bye. Ciao. Bye. -bye.